page 172. Richard beamed at her. You have given me something very precious, too. The lives of my friends. Thank you, Addie. And your spice soup be wonderful, she added with a hint of surprise. Yes, Kalin winked at him. It's as good as I make. Kalin has told me about Dark and Rawl and about the boundary failing, Addie said. It explains much. She has told me that you know of the pass and wish to cross into the Midlands. Now you must decide what you will do. She took a spoonful of soup. What do you mean? They must be awakened every day to drink, and they must be fed a gruel. Your friends be asleep for many days, five, maybe ten. You must decide as seeker if you are to wait for them or go on. We cannot help you. You must decide. That would be a lot of work for you to do by yourself. Addie nodded. Yes. But it not be as much work as going after the boxes as stopping dark and raw. She ate some more soup as she watched him. Richard stirred his spoon around absently in his bowl. There was a long silence. He looked to Kalin, but she showed nothing. He knew she didn't want to interfere with his decision. He looked back down at his soup. Every day that passes, he said quietly at last, brings Rawl closer to the last box. Zed told me he has a plan. That does not mean it is a good plan. And there may not be time to use it when he awakes at last. We could lose before we start. He looked up into Kalin's green eyes. We can't wait. We can't take the chance. Too much is at risk. We must leave without him. Kalin gave him a smile of reassurance. I wasn't planning on letting Chase go with us anyway. I have a more important job for him. Addie reached across the table and put her weathered hand on his. It felt soft and warm. It not be an easy choice to make. It not be easy to be seeker. That which lies ahead be difficult beyond your worst fears. He forced a smile. At least I still have my guide. The three of them sat in silence, considering what must be done. You both will have a good sleep tonight, Addie said. You will need it. After supper, I will tell you what you will need to know to get through the pass. She looked to each of them in turn. Her voice became even raspier. And I will tell you how I lost my foot. Chapter 17 Richard placed the lamp on the side of the table close to the wall and lit it with a stick from the fire. The sound of gentle rain and night creatures drifted in from the window. The chirps and calls of small animals going about their nocturnal lives were familiar to him, comforting sounds of home. Home. His last night in his homeland. And then he was to cross into the Midlands, as his father had done. He smiled to himself at the irony. His father had brought the Book of Counted Shadows out of the Midlands, and now he was taking it back. He sat down on the law ground across from Kalin and Addie. So tell me, how do we find the pass? Addie leaned back in her chair and swept her hand through the air. You already have. You'll be in the pass, the mouth of it anyway. And what do we need to know to get through it? The pass be a void in the underworld, but it still be a land of the dead. You be living. The beasts hunt the living if the living be big enough to be of interest. Richard looked at Kalin's impassive face, then back to Addie. What beasts? Addie's long finger pointed to each wall of the room in turn. They be the bones of the beasts. Your friends were touched by things of the underworld. The bones confused their powers. That be why I said your friends were being helped from the moment you brought them in here. The bones caused the magic poison to leave their bodies, letting the death sleep lift. The bones keep the evil away from here. The beasts cannot find me because they feel the evil of the bones, and it blinds them, makes them think I be one of them. Richard leaned forward. If we took some of the bones with us, would that protect us? Addie smiled her little smile, making her eyes wrinkle. Very good. 
That be exactly what you must do. These bones of the dead have the magic to help protect you. But there be more. Listen carefully to what I tell you. Richard folded his fingers together and nodded. You cannot take your horses. The trail be too small for them. There be places they cannot fit. You must not wander from the trail. It be very dangerous to do so. And you must not stop to sleep. It will take one day, one night, and most of the next day to cross. Why can't we stop to sleep? Richard asked. Addie looked to each of them with her white eyes. There be other things besides the beasts in the pass. They will get you if you stop long enough. Things? Kalen asked. Addie nodded. I go into the pass often. If you are careful, it be safe enough. If you are not careful, there be things that will get you. Her raspy voice lowered bitterly. I became overconfident. One day, I was walking a long time and became very tired. I was sure of myself, sure I knew the dangers well. So I sat against a tree and took a small nap for a few minutes only. She put her hand on her leg, rubbing it slowly. When I was asleep, a gripper fixed itself on my ankle. Kaylin scrunched up her features. What's a gripper? Addie regarded her in silence for a minute. A gripper be an animal that has armor all over his back, spikes all around the bottom edge, many legs underneath, each with a sharp hooked claw at the end, a mouth like a leech with teeth all around. He wraps himself around so only his armor is out. With his claws, he digs into the flesh to hold tight so you cannot pull him off, and then he fixes his mouth to you, sucking the blood from you, tightening with the claws all the time. Kaylin put her hand reassuringly on Addie's arm. The light from the lamp made the old woman's white eyes a pale shade of orange. Richard didn't move, his muscles tense. I had my axe with me. Kaylin closed her eyes as her head lowered. Addie went on. I tried to kill the gripper or at least get him off me. I knew that if I did not, he would suck all the lifeblood from me. His armor be harder than the axe. I was very angry with myself. The gripper be one of the slowest creatures in the past, but he be faster than a sleeping fool. She looked into Richard's eyes. There be only one thing I could do to save my life. I could stand the pain no longer. His teeth were scraping into the bone. I tied a strip of cloth tight around my thigh and laid my lower leg across a log. I used the axe to chop off my foot and ankle. The silence in the small house was brittle. Only Richard's eyes moved to meet Kalin's. He saw sorrow there for the old woman, saw his own sorrow reflected. He couldn't imagine the resolve it would take to use an axe to cut off your own foot. His stomach felt sick. Addie's thin lips spread in a grim smile. With one hand, she reached across the table to take Richard's hand, and with the other, took Kalin's. She held their hands in a firm grip. I tell you this story not to have you feel sorry for me. I tell you only so you two will not become prey to something in the past. Confidence can be a dangerous thing. Fear can bring you safe sometimes. Then I think we shall be very safe, Richard said. Addie continued to smile and gave a single nod. Good. There be one more thing. There'd be a place halfway through the pass where the two walls of the boundary come very close together, almost touching. It be called the Narrows. When you come to a rock of the size of this house, split down the middle, that be the place. You must pass through the rock. Do not go around it even though you may want to. Death be that way. And then beyond you must pass between the walls of the boundary. It be the most dangerous place in the pass. She put a hand on Kalin's shoulder and squeezed Richard's hand tighter, looking to each in turn. They will call to you from the boundary. They will want you to come to them. Who? Kalin asked. Addie leaned closer to her. The dead. It could be anyone you know who be dead. Your mother. Kalin bit her bottom lip. Is it really them? 
Addie shook her head. I don't know, child, but I do not believe it to be. I don't think so either, Richard said, almost more to reassure himself. Good, Addie rasped. Keep thinking so. It will help you to resist. You will be tempted to go to them. If you do, you are lost. And remember, in the Narrows, it'd be even more important to keep on the path the whole way through. A step or two off to either side, and you have gone too far. The walls of the boundary be that close. You will not be able to step back, ever. Richard let out a deep breath. Addie, the boundary is failing. Before he was struck down, Zed told me he could see the change. Chase said you couldn't see into it before, and that now underworld beings were getting out. Do you think it will still be safe to go through the narrows? Safe? I never said it'd be safe. It'd never be safe to go through the narrows. Many who are keen with greed but not strong of will have tried to go through and never come out the other side. She leaned closer to him. As long as the boundary be there still, so too must be the pass. Stay on the trail. Keep in mind your purpose. Help each other if need be, and you will get across. Addie studied his face. Richard turned to Kalin's green eyes. He wondered if Kalin and he could resist the boundary. He remembered what it felt like to want to go into it, to long for it. In the narrows, it would be on both sides of them. He knew how frightened Kalin was of the underworld, with good reason. She had been in it. He wasn't anxious to go anywhere near it himself. Richard frowned in thought. You said the narrows were in the center of the pass. Won't it be night? How will we see to stay on the trail? Addie put her hand on Kalin's shoulder to help herself up. Come, she said, as she put the crutch under her arm. She followed slowly behind as she worked her way to the shelves. Her slender fingers clutched a leather pouch. She loosened the drawstring and dumped something in her palm. She turned to Richard. Hold out your hand. He held his hand, palm up, in front of her. She put her hand over his, and he felt a smooth weight. In her native tongue, she spoke a few words under her breath. The words say, I give you this of my own free will. Richard saw that in his palm rested a rock about the size of a grouse egg. Smooth and polished, it was so dark it seemed as if it could suck the light from the room. He couldn't even discern a surface other than a layer of gloss. Beneath that was a void of blackness. This be a nightstone, she said in a measured rasp. And what do I do with it? Addie hesitated, her gaze darting briefly to the window. When it be dark and you have need enough, take out the nightstone and it will give off light so you may find your way. It only works for its owner, and then only if it be given of its last owner's free will. I will tell the wizard you have it. He has magic to find it, so he will be able to find you. Richard hesitated. Addie, this must be valuable. I don't feel right accepting it. Everything is valuable under the right conditions. To a man dying of thirst, water be more precious than gold. To a drowning man, water be of little worth and great trouble. Right now you are a very thirsty man. I thirst for dark and raw to be stopped. Take the night stone. If you feel the weight of obligation, you may return it to me one day. Richard nodded, slipped the stone into the leather pouch, and then into his pocket. Addie turned to the shelf once more and retrieved a delicate necklace, holding it up for Kalen to see. A few red and yellow beads were to each side of a small round bone. Kalen's eyes brightened, her mouth opened in surprise. It is just like my mother's, she said with delight. Addie placed it over her head while Kalen lifted clear her mass of dark hair. Kalen looked down at the necklace, touching it between her finger and thumb, smiling. For now, it will hide you from the beasts in the pass. And someday, when you carry a child of your own, it will protect her and help her to grow strong like you. Kaylin put her arms around the old woman, hugging her tight for a long time. When they separated, Kaylin's face bore a distressed expression, and she spoke in the language Richard didn't understand. Addie simply smiled and patted her shoulder sympathetically. 
You two should sleep now. What about me? Shouldn't I have a bone to hide me from the beasts? Addie studied his face, then looked down at his chest. Slowly, she reached out. Her fingers uncurled and touched his shirt tentatively, touched the tooth underneath. She pulled her hand back and looked back up into his eyes. Somehow, she knew about the tooth being there. Richard held his breath. You need no bone, Heartlander. The beasts cannot see you. His father had told him the thing guarding the book had been an evil beast. He realized the tooth was the reason the things from the boundary hadn't been able to find him as they had the others. If it hadn't been for the tooth, he would have been struck down as Zed and Chase were, and Kalin would be in the underworld now. Richard tried to keep his face from betraying any emotion. Addie seemed to get the hint and remained silent. Kalin seemed confused, but didn't ask. Sleep now, Addie said. Kalin refused Addie's offer of her bed. She and Richard laid their bedrolls near the fire, and Addie retired to her room. Richard put a few more logs in the fire, remembering how Kalin liked to be by a fire. He sat by Zed and Chase for a few minutes, smoothing the old man's white hair, listening to his even breathing. He hated to leave his friends behind. He was afraid of what was ahead. He wondered if Zed had an idea of where to look for one of the boxes. Richard wished he knew what Zed's plan was. Maybe it was some sort of wizard's trick to try on Dark and Rawl. Kaylin sat on the floor by the fire with her legs crossed, watching him. When he came back to his blanket, she lay down on her back, pulling the blanket up to her waist. The house was quiet and felt safe. Rain continued to fall outside. It felt good being by the fire. He was tired. Richard turned toward Kaylin, his elbow on the floor and his head propped in his hand. She stared up at the ceiling, turning the bone on the necklace between her finger and thumb. He watched her breast rise and fall with her breathing. Richard, she whispered while continuing to stare at the ceiling. I'm sorry we have to leave them behind. I know, he whispered back. Me too. I hope you do not feel I forced you to do it because of what I said when we were in the swamp. No, it was the right decision. Every day brings winter closer. It will do us no good to wait with them while Rahl gets the boxes. Then we will all be dead. The truth is the truth. I can't be angry at you for saying it. He listened to the fire snap and hiss as he watched her face, the way her hair lay across the floor. He could see a vein in her neck pulsing with her heartbeat. He thought that she had the most delicious-looking neck he had ever seen. Sometimes she looked so beautiful he could hardly stand to look at her and at the same time could not look away. She still held the necklace in her fingers. Kalen, she turned to his eyes. When Addie told you the necklace would protect you and someday your child, what did you say to her? She gazed at him a long moment. I thanked her, but I told her I did not think I would live long enough to have a child. Richard felt bumps rise on the skin of his arms. Why would you say that? Her eyes moved in little flicks as she studied different places on his face. Richard, she said quietly, madness is loose in my homeland, madness you cannot imagine. I am but one. They are many. I have seen people better than me go against it and be slaughtered. I am not saying I think we will fail, but I do not think I will live to know. Even if she wasn't saying it, Richard knew she didn't think he would live either. She was trying not to frighten him, but she thought he would die in the effort too. That was why she hadn't wanted Zed to give him the sword of truth to make him seek her. He felt as if his heart were coming up into his throat. She believed she was leading them to their death. Maybe she was right, he mused. After all, she knew more about what they were up against than he did. She must be terrified to go back to the Midlands. But then there was no place to hide. The Night Wisp had said that to run was a sure death. Richard kissed the end of his finger and then touched it against the bone on the necklace. He looked back up into her soft eyes. I add my oath of protection to the bone, he said in a whisper. To you, now, and to any child you may bear in the future. I would trade no day I spend with you for a life of safe slavery. I accepted the post of seeker of my own free will, and if Dark and Rahl takes the whole world into madness, then we will die with a sword in our hands, not chains on our wings. We will not allow it to be easy for them to kill us. They will pay a high price. We will fight with our last breath if need be, and in our death, let us inflict a wound on him that will fester until it claims him. 
A smile spread across her face until her eyes were caught up in it. If Dark and Rao knew you as I do, he would have reason to lose sleep. I thank the good spirits the Seeker has no cause to come after me in anger. She laid her head down on her arm. You have an odd talent for making me feel better, Richard Cipher, even when telling me of my death. He smiled. That's what friends are for. Richard watched her for a while after she closed her eyes until sleep gently took him. His last thoughts before it came were of her. The first hint of morning was damp and dreary, but the rain had stopped. Kaylin was giving Addie a parting hug. Richard faced the old woman, looking into her white eyes. I must ask you to do an important task. You must give Chase a message from the Seeker. Tell him he is to go back to Heartland and warn the First Counselor that the boundary will be down soon. Have him tell Michael to gather the army to protect Westland from Rawls' forces. They must be prepared to fight at any invasion. They must not let Westland fall as did the Midlands. Any forces that come across must be deemed invaders. Have him tell Michael that Rawl is the one who killed our father, and those who come do not come in peace. We are at war, and I am already joined in battle. If my brother or the army fails to heed my warning, then Chase is to abandon the service of the government and gather the boundary wardens to stand against Rawl's legions. His army was virtually unopposed when they took the Midlands. If they have to shed blood freely to take Westland, maybe they will lose their spirit. Tell him to show no mercy to the enemy, take no prisoners. I take no joy in giving these orders, but it's the way Rawl fights, and either we meet him on his terms or we die on them. If Westland is taken, I expect the wardens to extract a terrible price before they fall. After Chase has the army and wardens in place, he is free to come to my aid, if he chooses to do so. As above all else, we must stop Rawl from getting all three boxes. Richard looked down at the ground. Have him tell my brother that I love him and I miss him. He looked up and gauged Eddie's expression. Can you remember all that? I do not think I could forget it if I wanted to. I will tell the warden your words. What would you have me tell the wizard? Richard smiled. That I'm sorry we couldn't wait for him, but I know he will understand. When he is able, he will find us by the nightstone. I hope by then to have found one of the boxes. Strength to the seeker, Addie said in a rasp. And you too, child. Grim times lie ahead. Chapter 18 The trail was wide enough to allow Richard and Kalen to walk side by side after they left Addie's place. Clouds hung thick and threatening, but the rain held off. Both wrapped their cloaks tight. Damp brown pine needles matted the path through the forest. There was little brush among the big trees, allowing an open view for a good distance. Ferns covered the ground in feathery swaths through the trees, and dead wood lay in it here and there as if asleep in a bed. Squirrels scolded the two of them as they hiked along, while birds sang with monotonous conviction. Richard picked at the branch of a small balsam fir as they walked past, stripping the needles between his thumb and the crook of his first finger. Addie is more than she seems, he said at last. Kaylin looked up at him as they walked. She is a sorceress. Richard glanced sideways at her in surprise. Really? I don't know exactly what a sorceress is. Well, she is more than us, but less than a wizard. Richard smelled the aromatic fragrance of the balsam needles, then cast them aside. Maybe she was more than he, Richard thought, but he wasn't at all sure she was more than Kaylin. He remembered the look on Addie's face when Kalen had grabbed her by the wrist. It had been a look of fear. He remembered the look on Zed's face when he had first seen her. What power did she have that could frighten a sorceress and a wizard? What had she done that had caused thunder without sound? She had done it twice that he knew of, once with the quad and once with Shar the night wisp. Richard remembered the pain that had followed. A sorceress greater than Kalen? He wondered. What's Addie doing living here in the pass? Kaylin pushed some of her hair back over her shoulder. She became tired of people coming to her all the time, wanting spells and potions. She wanted to be left alone to study whatever it is a sorceress studies, some sort of higher summons, as she called it. Do you think she will be safe when the boundary fails? I hope so. I like her. Me too, 
he added with a smile. The trail, climbing sharply in places, forced them to go single file at times as it twisted along steep rocky hillsides and over ridges. Richard let Kaylin go first so he could keep an eye on her, make sure she didn't wander off the path. At times, he had to point out the trail, his experience as a guide making it plain to him, but not to her unpracticed eye. Other times, the trail was a well-defined rut. The woods were thick. Trees grew from splits in the rock that pushed up above the leaf litter. Mist drifted among the trees. Roots bulging from cracks provided handholds as they climbed the abrupt inclines. His legs ached from the effort of descending extreme drops in the dark trail. Richard wondered what they were going to do once they reached the Midlands. He had depended on Zed to let him know the plan once they crossed the pass, and now they were without Zed, without a plan. He felt kind of foolish to be charging into the Midlands. What was he going to do once they crossed over? Stand there and look around, divine where the box was, and then be off after it? Didn't sound like a good plan to him. They didn't have time to wander about aimlessly, hoping they would come across something. No one was going to be waiting for him waiting to tell him where to go next. They reached a steep jumble of rock. The trail was straight up the face. Richard surveyed the terrain. It would be easier to go around rather than climb over the jut of rock, but he finally decided against it, the thought that the boundary could be anywhere making up his mind. There must be a reason the trail went this way. He went first and took Kalen's hand, helping to pull her up. As he walked, Richard's thoughts continued nagging at him. Someone had hidden one of the boxes, or Rawl would have it already. If Rawl couldn't find it, how was Richard to? He didn't know anyone in the Midlands. He didn't know where to look. But someone knew where the last box was, and that was how they had to find it. They couldn't look for the box. They had to look for someone who would be able to tell them where it was. Magic, he thought suddenly. The Midlands was a land of magic. Maybe someone with magic could tell where the box was. They had to look for someone with the right kind of magic. Addie could tell things about him without ever having seen him before. There had to be someone with the kind of magic that could tell him where the box was without ever having seen it. Then, of course, they had to convince that person to tell them. But maybe if someone was hiding their knowledge from Dark and Rahl, he would be glad to help stop him. It seemed there were too many wishes and hopes in his thoughts. But there was one thing he did know. Even if Raoul got all the boxes without the book, he wasn't going to know which box was which. As they walked along, Richard recited the Book of Counted Shadows to himself, trying to find a way to stop Raoul. Since it was an instruction book for the boxes, it should have a way to stop their use. But there was nothing like that in the book. The actual explanation of what each box would do, directives to determine which box was which, and how to open one, took up only a relatively small portion at the end of the book. Richard understood this part well, as it was clear and precise. Most of the book, though, was taken up with directions for countering unforeseen eventualities, resolving problems that could prevent the holder of the boxes from succeeding. The book even started out with how to verify the truth of the instructions. If he could create one of these problems, he could stop Rawl, since Rawl didn't have the book to help him. But most of the problems were things he had no way of bringing about. Problems with sun angles and clouds on the day of opening. And a lot of it made no sense to him. It spoke of things he had never heard of. Richard told himself to stop thinking of the problem and to think of the solution. He would go through the book again. He cleared his mind and started at the beginning. Verification of the truth of the words of the Book of Counted Shadows if spoken by another rather than read by the one who commands the boxes can only be ensured by the use of a confessor. By late afternoon, Richard and Kalin were sweating freely with the effort of the hike. As they crossed a small stream, Kalin stopped and dipped a cloth in the water and used it to wipe her face. Richard thought it was a good idea. When they came to the next stream, he stopped to do the same. The clear water was shallow as it ran over a bed of round stones. He balanced on a flat rock as he squatted to soak a cloth in the cold water. When he stood up, Richard saw the shadow thing. He froze instantly. Off through the woods, there was something standing partly behind a tree trunk. It wasn't a person, but was about that size with no definite shape. It looked like a person's shadow standing up in the air. 
The shadow thing didn't move. Richard blinked and squinted his eyes, trying to tell if he was really seeing what he thought he was seeing. Maybe it was just a trick of the dim afternoon light, a shadow of a tree he mistook for something more. Kalin had continued to walk along the trail. Richard came quickly up behind her and put his hand on the small of her back, below her pack, so she wouldn't stop. He leaned over her shoulder and whispered in her ear, Look to the left, off through the trees, tell me what you see. He kept his hand on her back, kept her walking along as she turned her head, looking off to the trees. Her eyes searched as she held her hair back, out of the way. Then she saw the thing. What is it? She whispered, looking back to his face. He was a little surprised. I don't know. I thought maybe you could tell me. She shook her head. The shadow remained motionless. Maybe it was nothing. A trick of the light, he tried to tell himself. He knew that wasn't true. Maybe it's one of the beasts Addie told us about and it can't see us, he offered. She gave him a sidelong glance. Beasts have bones. Kaylin was right, of course, but he had been hoping she would have agreed with the idea. As they moved quickly down the trail, the shadow thing stayed where it was, and they were soon out of sight of it. Richard breathed easier. It appeared that the bone necklace Kaylin wore and his tooth had hidden them. They ate a supper of bread, carrots, and smoked meat as they walked. Neither enjoyed the meal. Their eyes searched off into the deep woods as they ate. Even though it hadn't rained all day, everything was still wet, and occasionally water dripped from the trees. The rock was slick with slime in places, needing care to be crossed safely. Both watched the surrounding forest for any sign of danger. They saw nothing. The fact that they saw nothing began to worry Richard. There were no squirrels, no chipmunks, no birds, no animals of any kind. It was too quiet. Daylight was slipping away. Soon they would be at the Narrows. He worried about that, too. The idea of seeing the things from the boundary again was frightening. The idea of seeing his father again was terrifying. His insides cringed at what Addie had told them, that those in the boundary would call to them. He remembered how seductive their calls were. He had to be prepared to resist. He had to harden himself against it. Kalin had almost been pulled back into the underworld when they were in the wayward pine the first night he knew her. When they were with Zed and Chase, something had tried to pull her in again. He was troubled that the bone might not protect her when they were that close. The trail leveled out and widened, allowing them to walk side by side again. He was tired from the day's hike, and it would be another night and day before they could rest. Crossing the narrows in the dark, and when they were exhausted, sounded like a bad idea, but Addie had been insistent they not stop. He could not question a person who knew the pass as well as she. He knew that the story of the gripper would keep him wide awake. Kalin looked around at the woods, turned to check behind. She stopped suddenly, grabbing his arm. In the trail, not ten yards behind, stood a shadow. Like the other, this one did not move. He could see through it, see the woods behind as if it were made of smoke. Kalin kept a firm grip on his arm as both of them walked ahead in a sideways fashion, watching the shadow thing. They rounded a turn in the trail and were away from it. They walked on faster. Kalin, do you remember when you told me of the shadow people that Panis Rahl sent forth? Could those be shadow people? She gave him a worried look. I don't know. I have never seen one. They were in the last war before I was born, but the stories were always told the same, that they floated along. I never heard anyone say they stood still like that. Maybe it's because of the bones. Maybe they know we're here but can't find us, so they stay still to search. She wrapped her cloak tighter, obviously afraid of his idea, but didn't say anything. In the gathering night, they walked along close to each other, sharing the same troubling thoughts. Another shadow stood at the side of the trail. Kalin gripped his arm tight. They passed slowly, quietly, keeping their eyes on it. It didn't move. Richard felt like panicking, but knew he couldn't. They had to stay on the trail, had to use their heads. Maybe the shadows were trying to make them bolt, to run from the trail and cross over accidentally into the underworld. They looked around, behind as they went. When Kalin was looking the other way, a branch brushed her face. She jumped against him with a start. She looked over and apologized. Richard gave her a reassuring smile. 
pine needles held droplets from the rains and mist, and when a light breeze swayed the branches, water from the trees above rained down. In the near darkness, they had a hard time telling if there were shadow things around them or if it was just the dark shapes of tree trunks. Twice they had no trouble telling. They were close to the trail, and there was no doubt what they were. Still, the shadows did not follow or move, but stood as if watching, even though they had no eyes. What are we going to do if they come for us? Kalen asked in a tense voice. Her grip on his arm was becoming painful, so he pried her fingers off and put her hand in his. She gave his hand a squeeze. Sorry, she said with a self-conscious smile. If they come for us, the sword will stop them, he answered confidently. What makes you so sure? It stopped the things in the boundary. She seemed satisfied with the answer. He wished he were. The forest was dead quiet except for a soft rasp he couldn't quite figure out. There were none of the usual night sounds. Dark branches swayed near them with the breeze, making his heart race. Richard, Caelan said quietly, don't let them touch you. If they are shadow people, their touch is death. Even if they are not shadow people, we don't know what would happen. We must not let them touch us. He gave her hand a squeeze of reassurance. Richard resisted the temptation to pull the sword. There might be too many for the sword, if the sword's magic even worked against shadows. If there was no other choice, he would use the sword, but for now his instincts told him not to. The woods were getting darker. Tree trunks stood like black pillars in the murk. Richard felt as if there were eyes everywhere watching. The trail was beginning to traverse a hillside, and he could see dark rocks rising up to their left. Runoff from the rains trickled through the rock. He could hear it bubbling and dripping and splashing. The ground dropped away on the right. The next time they looked back, there were three shadows barely visible in the path behind. The two of them kept moving. Richard heard the soft scraping sound again, off in the woods to either side. It wasn't a sound he was familiar with. He could feel more than see that there were shadow things on each side and behind them. A few were close enough to the trail that there was no doubt what they were. The only way that was clear was ahead. Richard, Kalen whispered, do you think you should take up the nightstone? I can hardly see the path. She was gripping his hand tightly. Richard hesitated. I don't want to until we absolutely need it. I'm afraid of what might happen. What do you mean? Well, those shadows haven't come for us yet. Maybe because they can't see us because of the bones. He paused a moment. But what if they can see the light from the nightstone? Kalen bit her bottom lip in worry. They strained to pick out the trail as it twisted to go around trees and boulders, over rocks and roots, cutting its way across the hillside. The soft scraping sound was nearer all around. It sounded like... It sounded like claws on rock, he thought. Two shadows stood ahead, close, the trail between them. Kalen pressed tight against him and held her breath as they squeezed past. She buried her face against his shoulder when they were even with the shadow things. Richard put his arm around her, holding her tight. He knew how she felt. He was terrified, too. His heart pounded. It seemed they were going too far with each step, getting in too deep. He looked behind, but in the darkness there was not enough light to see if the shadows were standing on the trail. Abruptly, an inky black shape loomed up before them. It was an enormous boulder split down the middle, the narrows. They pressed their backs up against the boulder at the split. It was too dark to see the trail anymore, or if there were any shadow things close. They couldn't follow the trail through the narrows without the light of the nightstone. It was far too dangerous. One wrong step in the narrows and they were dead. In the stillness, the scraping sound was closer, all around them. Richard reached into his pocket and pulled out the leather pouch. He loosened the drawstring, dumped the nightstone into his palm. Warm light flared into the night, lighting the woods around, casting eerie shadows. He held the stone out to see better. Kalen gasped. In the warm, yellowish illumination, they could see a wall of the shadow things, hundreds of them, not an inch between any two. They formed a half circle less than 20 feet away. On the ground were dozens and dozens of hump-shaped creatures, almost looking like rocks at first, but they weren't rocks. Gray armor bands interlocked across their backs. Jagged spikes poked out around the bottom edge. Grippers. 
That was what the sound was, their claws on the rocks. The grippers were moving with an odd waddling gait, their humped bodies swaying from side to side as they struggled forward. Not fast, but steady. Some were only a few feet away. For the first time, the shadows began to move, floating, drifting, tightening their ring. Kaylin stood frozen, her back against the boulder, her eyes wide. Richard reached across the split, grabbed a fistful of her shirt, and pulled her into the opening. The walls were wet and slick. The tightness of the space made him feel as if his heart were coming up in his throat. He didn't like tight places. They backed through, turning occasionally to check their way. He held the nightstone out, lighting the shadow things as they came. Grippers crawled into the split. Richard could hear the sound of Kalin's rapid breathing echoing in the confining, dank space. They continued backing up, their shoulders sliding against the sides of the rock. Cold, slimy water soaked their shirts. In one spot, they had to duck down and turn sideways because the crack narrowed, almost closing together, opened just enough for them to pass down low. Forest debris, fallen into the split, lay in the dampness, decomposing. The place smelled of sickening rot. They continued moving sideways and at last reached the other side. The shadows stopped when they reached the opening in the rock. The grippers didn't. Richard kicked one that got too close, sending it tumbling through the leaves and sticks on the floor of the split. Landing on its back, it clawed at the air, snapping and hissing, twisting and rocking until it righted itself. When it did, the gripper rose up on its claw-tipped feet and let out a clicking growl before coming on once again. Both turned quickly to follow the path. Richard held the nightstone out to light the narrow's trail. Kalen drew a sharp breath. The warm light illuminated the hillside where the narrow's path should have been. Spread out before them, as far as they could see, was a mass of rubble. Rocks, tree limbs, splintered wood and mud all tumbled together. A slide had recently plunged down the hillside. The narrow's trail had been swept away. They took a step beyond the rock to have a better look. Green light of the boundary came on, surprising them. They stepped back as one. Richard. Kalen clutched his arm. The grippers were at their heels. The shadows floated in the split. Chapter 19. Torches set in ornate gold brackets lit the walls of the crypt with flickering light, reflected off the polished pink granite of the huge vaulted room, lending their smell of pitch to the fragrance of roses in the dead still air. White roses, replaced every morning without fail for the last three decades, filled each of the 57 gold vases set in the wall beneath each of the 57 torches that represented each year in the life of the deceased. The floor was white marble, so that any white rose petal that fell would not be a distraction before it could be whisked away. A large staff saw to it that no torch was allowed to go spent for longer than a few moments, and that rose petals were not allowed to rest long upon the floor. The staff was attentive and devoted to their tasks. Failure to be so resulted in an immediate beheading. Guards watched the tomb day and night to be sure the torches burned, the flowers were fresh, and no rose petals sat too long on the floor. And, of course, to carry out executions. Staff positions were filled from the surrounding Daharan countryside. Being a member of the crypt staff was an honor by law. The honor brought with it the promise of a quick death if an execution was in order. A slow death in Dahara was greatly feared and common. New recruits, for fear they would speak ill of the dead king while in the crypt, had their tongues cut out. The master, on the evenings when he was alone in the people's palace, would visit the tomb. No staff or tomb guards were allowed to be present during these visits. The staff had spent a busy afternoon replacing the torches with freshly burning ones and tested each of the hundreds of white roses by gently shaking them to make sure none of the petals were loose, since any torch going out during the royal visit or any rose petal falling to the floor would result in an execution. A short pillar in the center of the immense room supported the coffin itself, giving it the effect of floating in the air. The golden shrouded coffin glowed in the torchlight, Carved symbols covered its sides and continued in a ring around the room, cut into the granite beneath the torches and gold vases. Instructions in an ancient language from a father to a son on the process of going to the underworld and returning. 
instructions in an ancient language understood by only a handful other than the sun. None but the sun lived in Dahara. All the others in Dahara who understood had long ago been put to death. Someday the rest would be. The crypt staff and guards had been sent away. The master was visiting his father's tomb. Two of his personal guards stood watch over him, one to each side of the massive, elaborately carved and polished door. Their sleeveless leather and male uniforms helped display their bulky forms, the sharp contours of their heavy muscles, and the bands they wore around their arms just above their elbows, bands with raised projections sharpened to deadly edges used in close combat to tear apart an adversary. Dark and Rawl ran his delicate fingers over the carved symbols on his father's tomb. An immaculate white robe, its only decoration gold embroidery in a narrow band around the neck and down the front, covered his lean frame to within an inch of the floor. He wore no jewelry other than a curved knife and a gold scabbard embossed with symbols warning the spirits to give way. The belt that held it was woven of gold wire. Fine, straight, blonde hair hung almost to his shoulders. His eyes were a painfully handsome shade of blue. His features set off his eyes perfectly. Many women had been taken to his bed. Because of his striking looks and his power, some went eagerly. The others went despite his looks, but because of his power. Whether or not they were eager did not concern him. Were they unwise enough to be repulsed when they saw the scars, they entertained him in ways they could not have foreseen. Dark and Rawl, as had his father before him, considered women merely vessels for the man's seed, the dirt it grew in, unworthy of higher recognition. Dark and Rawl, as his father before him, would have no wife. His own mother had been nothing more than the first to sprout his father's wondrous seed, and then she had been discarded, as was only fitting. If he had siblings, he didn't know, nor did it matter. He was first born. All glory fell to him. He was the one born with the gift, and the one to whom his father passed the knowledge. If he had half-brothers or sisters, they were merely weeds to be expunged if discovered. Dark and Rawl spoke the words silently in his mind as his fingers traced the symbols. Although it was of the utmost importance that the directives were followed exactly, he had no fear of making an error. The instructions were burned into his memory, but he enjoyed reliving the thrill of the passage, of hanging between life and death. He savored going into the underworld, commanding the dead. He was impatient for the next journey. Footsteps echoed at someone's approach. Dark and Rawl showed no concern or interest, but his guards did. They drew their swords. No one was allowed to come into the crypt with the master. When they saw who it was, they stood down, replacing their weapons. No one but Demin Nas, that is. Demin Nas, the right hand of Rawl, the lightning of the master's dark thoughts, was a man as big as those he commanded. As he strode in, ignoring the guards, his sharp, chiseled muscles stood out in stark relief in the torchlight. His chest was covered with skin as smooth as that of the young boys he had a weakness for. In stark contrast, his face was riddled with pockmarks. His blonde hair was cropped close enough to cause it to stand up in a collection of spikes. A streak of black hair started in the middle of his right eyebrow and continued back over his head to the right of center. It made him recognizable from a distance, a fact appreciated by those who had cause to know of him. Dark and Rawl stood absorbed in the reading of the symbols and did not look when his guards drew their weapons or when they replaced them. Although his guards were formidable, they were unnecessary, mere accoutrements of his position. He had powers enough to put down any threat. Demon Nas stood at ease, waiting for the master to finish. When at last Dark and Rawl turned, his blonde hair and stark white robe swished around with him. Demon gave a respectful bow of his head. Lord Rawl. His voice was deep, coarse. He kept his head bowed. Demon, my old friend, how good to see you again. Rawl's quiet tone had a clear, almost liquid quality to it. Demon straightened, his face set in a frown of displeasure. Lord Rawl, Queen Milena has delivered her list of demands. Dark and Rawl stared through the commander as if he weren't there, slowly wetting the tips of the first three fingers of his right hand with his tongue, and then carefully stroking his lips and eyebrows with them. Have you brought me a boy? 
Rawl asked expectantly. Yes, Lord Rawl. He awaits you in the Garden of Life. Good. A small smile spread across Dark and Rawl's handsome face. Good. And he is not too old. He is still a boy. Yes, Lord Rawl. He is but a boy. Damien looked away from Rawl's blue eyes. Dark and Rawl's smile widened. You are sure, Damien? Did you take off his pants yourself and check? Damon shifted his weight. Yes, Lord Rawl. Rawl's eyes searched the other's face. You didn't touch him, did you? His smile vanished. He must be unsoiled. No, Lord Rawl, Damon insisted, looking back to the master, his eyes wide. I would not touch your spirit guide. You have forbidden it. Dark and Rawl again wet his fingers and smoothed his eyebrows as he took a step closer. I know you wanted to, Damon. Was it hard for you? Looking but not touching. His smile came back, teasing, then melted again. Your weakness has caused me trouble before. I took care of that, Damon protested in his deep voice, but not too forcefully. I had that traitor, Brophy, arrested for the murder of that boy. Yes, Raoul snapped back, and then he submitted to a confessor to prove his innocence. Damon's face wrinkled in frustration. How was I to know he would do that? Who could expect a man would willingly do that? Raoul held up his hand. Damon fell silent. You should have been more careful. You should have taken the confessors into account. And is that job finished yet? All but one, Damon admitted. The quad that went after Kalin, the mother confessor, failed. I had to send another. Dark and Rawl frowned. Confessor Kalin is the one who took the confession of this traitor, Brophy, and found him innocent. Is she not? Damon nodded slowly, his face contorted in anger. She must have found help, or the quad would not have failed. Rawl remained silent, watching the other. At last, Demon broke the silence. It is but a small matter, Lord Rawl, not worthy of your time or thought. Dark and Rawl lifted an eyebrow. I will decide what matters are worthy of my attention. His voice was soft, almost kind. Of course, Lord Rawl, please forgive me. Demon didn't need to hear an angry tone to know he was treading on dangerous ground. Rawl licked his fingers again and rubbed them on his lips. He looked sharply back up into the other's eyes. Damon, if you touched the boy, I will know. A bead of sweat rolled into Damon's eye. He tried to blink it away. Lord Rawl, he said in a coarse whisper, I would gladly give my life for you. I would not touch your spirit guide, I swear. Dark and Rawl considered Damon Nass for a moment, then nodded. As I said, I would know anyway. And you know what I would do to you if you ever lied to me. I can't tolerate anyone lying to me. It's wrong. Lord Rall, Damon said, anxious to change the subject. What of Queen Milena's demands? Rall shrugged. Tell her I agree to all her demands in return for the box. Demon stared incredulously. But, Lord Rawl, you have not seen them listed. Rawl shrugged innocently. Now, they are truly a matter not worthy of my time or thought. Damon shifted his weight again, making the leather he wore creak. Lord Rawl, I do not understand why you play this game with the Queen. It is humiliating to be issued a list of demands. With no trouble, we could crush her like the fat toad she is. Just give me the word. Allow me to issue my own demands on your behalf. She will be made to regret not bowing down to you as she should have. Raoul smiled, a small private smile, as he studied the pockmarked face of his loyal commander. She has a wizard, Damon, he whispered, his blue eyes intense. I know. Damon's fists tightened. Giller. You have only to ask, Lord Rawl, and I will bring you his head. Damon, why do you think Queen Melena would enlist a wizard in her service? Damon only shrugged. So Rawl answered his own question. 
to protect the box. That is why. It is her protection, too, she believes. If we kill her or the wizard, we may find he has hidden the box with magic, and then we would have to spend time finding it. So why move too quickly? For now, the easiest path is to go along with her. If she gives me any trouble, I will deal with her and the wizard. He walked slowly around his father's coffin, trailing his fingers along the carved symbols as he kept his blue eyes on Demon. And anyway, once I have the last box, her demands will be meaningless. He came back to the big man, stopping in front of him. But there is another reason, my friend. Demon cocked his head to the side. Another reason? Dark and Rawl nodded, leaned closer, and lowered his voice. Damien, do you kill your little boyfriends before or after? Damon leaned back a little, away from the other, hooking a thumb in his belt. He cleared his throat. At last he answered, After. And why after? Why not before? Rawl asked, his face in a coy, questioning frown. Damon avoided the master's eyes, looked down at the floor, and shifted his weight to his other foot. Dark and Rawl continued to keep his face close, watching, waiting. In a voice too low for the guards to hear, Demon spoke. I like it when they squirm. A slow smile spread over Rawl's face. That is the other reason, my friend. I, too, enjoy it when they squirm, so to speak. I want to enjoy watching her squirm before I kill her. He licked the ends of his fingers again and stroked them on his lips. A knowing grin grew across the pockmarked face. I will tell Queen Milena that Father Rall has graciously agreed to her terms. Dark and Rall put his hand on Damon's muscled shoulder. Very good, my friend. Now, show me what manner of boy you have brought me. Both wearing smiles, they strode toward the door. Before they reached it, Dark and Rall stopped suddenly. He spun on his heels, his robes flinging around him. What was that sound? he demanded. Except for the hiss of the torches, the crypt was as silent as the dead king. Demon and the guards looked slowly around the chamber. There! Rall thrust out his arm. The other three looked where he pointed. A single white rose petal sat on the floor. Dark and Rall's face reddened, his eyes fierce. Shaking, his hands clenched into white-knuckled fists, his eyes filled with tears of wrath. He was too furious to speak. Regaining his composure, he held out his hand toward where the white petal lay on the cold marble floor. As if touched by a breeze, it rose into the air and floated across the room, settling in Rawl's outstretched hand. He licked the petal, turned to one of the guards, and stuck it to the man's forehead. The heavily muscled guard looked back impassively. He knew what the master wanted and gave a single grim nod before turning and going through the door in one fluid motion, pulling his sword as he went. Dark and Rawl straightened his body, smoothed his hair, and then his robes with the flats of his hands. He took a deep breath, letting his anger out with it. Frowning, his blue eyes searched up at Demon, who stood calmly beside him. I ask nothing else of them, only that they care for my father's tomb. Their needs are seen to, they are fed and clothed and taken care of. It is a simple request. His face took on a hurt look. Why do they mock me with this carelessness? He looked over to his father's coffin, then back to the other's face. Do you think I am too harsh with them, Damon? The commander's hard eyes scowled back. Not harsh enough. If you are not so compassionate, if you didn't allow them a quick punishment, maybe the others would learn to treat your heartfelt requests with more commitment. I would not be as lenient. Dark and Rawl stared off at nothing in particular and nodded absently. After a time, he took another deep breath and strode through the door, with Demon at his side and the remaining guard following at a respectful distance. They went down long corridors of polished granite lit by torches, up spiral stairs of white stone, down more corridors with windows that let the light out into the darkness. The stone smelled damp, stale. Several levels up, the air regained its freshness. 
Small tables of lustrous wood stationed at intervals along the halls held vases with bouquets of fresh flowers that lent a light fragrance to the rooms. As they came to a pair of doors with a scene of hillsides and forests carved in relief, the second guard rejoined them, the task assigned him completed. Demon pulled on the iron rings, and the heavy doors opened smoothly, silently. Beyond was a room of dark brown oak panels. It gleamed in the light of the candles and lamps set about on heavy tables. Books lined two walls, and an immense fireplace warmed the two-story room. Rawl stopped for a short time to consult an old leather-bound book sitting on a pedestal. Then he and his commander walked on through a labyrinth of rooms, most covered in the same warm wood panels. A few were plastered and painted with scenes of the Dahara countryside, forests and fields, game and children. The guards followed at a distance, watching everywhere, alert but silent. The master's shadows. Logs crackled and popped as flames wavered in a brick hearth, providing the only light in one of the smaller rooms they passed into. On the walls hung trophies of the hunt, heads of every sort of beast. Antlers jutted out, lit by the light of the flames. Dark and Rawl stopped suddenly in mid-stride, his robes made pink in the firelight. Again, he whispered. Demon had stopped when Rawl did, and now watched him with questioning eyes. Again she comes to the boundary, to the underworld. He licked his fingertips, smoothing them carefully over his lips and eyebrows as his eyes fixed in a stare. Who? Demon asked. The mother confessor, Kaelin. She has the help of a wizard, you know. Giller is with the queen, Demon insisted, not with the mother confessor. A thin smile spread on Dark and Rawl's lips. Not Giller, he whispered. The old one, the one I seek. The one who killed my father. She has found him. Demon stood straight in surprise. Rawl turned and walked over to the window at the end of the room. Made up of small panes and round at the top, it stood twice his height. Firelight glinted off the curved knife at his belt. Clasping his hands behind him, he stood gazing down on the darkened countryside, on the night, on the things others couldn't see. He turned back to Demon his blonde hair brushing his shoulders. That is why she went to Westland, you know, not to run from the quad, as you thought, but to find the great wizard. His blue eyes sparkled. She has done me a great favor, my friend. She has flushed out the wizard. It is fortunate she slipped past the ones in the underworld. Fate is truly on our side. You see, Damon, why I tell you not to worry so? It is my destiny to succeed. All things have a way of working toward my ends. Demon's brow knitted into a frown. Just because one quad failed, that does not mean she has found the wizard. Quads have failed before. Rahl slowly licked his fingertips. He stepped closer to the big man. The old one has named a seeker, he whispered. Demon unclasped his hands in surprise. Are you sure? Rawl nodded. The old wizard vowed never to help him again. No one has seen him in many years. No one has been able to offer his name, even to save their own lives. Now the confessor crosses into Westland, the quad vanishes, and a seeker is named. He smiled to himself. She must have touched him to make him help. Imagine his surprise when he saw her. Rawl's smile faded. He clenched his fists. I almost had them. Almost had all three. But I was distracted by other matters and they slipped away. For the time being. He considered this silently for a moment, then announced. The second quad will fail too, you know. They will not be expecting to encounter a wizard. Then I will send a third quad and I will tell them of the wizard. Demon promised. No. Raoul licked his fingertips, thinking. Not yet. For now, let's wait and see what happens. Maybe she is meant to help me again. He considered this a moment. Is she attractive? The mother confessor. Demon scowled. I have never seen her, but some of my men have. 
They fought over who would be named to the quads, who would have her. Don't send another quad for now, Dark and Rawl smiled. It is time I had an heir. He nodded absently. I will have her for myself, he declared. If she tries to go through the boundary, she will be lost, Demon cautioned. Rawl shrugged. Maybe she will be smarter than that. She has already shown herself to be clever. Either way, I will have her. He glanced over at Demon. Either way, she will squirm for me. The two of them are dangerous, the wizard and the mother confessor. They will cause us trouble. Confessors subvert the word of Rahl. They are an annoyance. I think we should do as you first planned. We should kill her. Rahl gave a wave of his hand. You worry too much, Damon. As you said, confessors are an annoyance, nothing more. I will kill her myself, if she proves troublesome. But after she bears me a son, a confessor son. The wizard cannot harm me, as he did my father. I will see him squirm when I kill him. Slowly. And the seeker? Demon's face was hard with apprehension. Rahl shrugged. Even less than an annoyance. Lord Rahl, I need not remind you winter approaches. The master lifted an eyebrow, the firelight flickering in his eyes. The queen has the last box. I will have it soon enough. There is no need for concern. Demon leaned his grim face closer. And the book. Rahl took a deep breath. After I have traveled to the underworld, I will search out the cipher boy again. Worry yourself of it no more, my friend. Fate is on our side. He turned and walked off. Demon followed, the guards slipping through the shadows behind. The Garden of Life was a cavernous room in the center of the People's Palace. Leaded windows high overhead let in light for the lush plants. This night they let in the moonlight. Around the outside of the room were flowers set in beds with walkways winding through. Beyond the flowers were small trees, short stone walls and vines covering them, and well-tended plants completing the landscaping. Except for the windows overhead, it mimicked an outdoor garden, a place of beauty, a place of peace. In the center of the expansive room was an area of lawn that swept around almost into a circle, a grass ring broken by a wedge of white stone, upon which sat a slab of granite, smooth but for grooves carved near the edge of the top, leading to a small well in one corner. It was held up by two short fluted pedestals. Beyond the slab stood a polished stone block set next to a fire pit. The block held an ancient iron bowl covered with beasts, which served as legs to support the round bottom. The iron lid in the same half-sphere shape had but one beast upon it, a Shinga, an underworld creature, reared up on its two hind legs, serving as a handle. In the center of the lawn lay a round area of white sorcerer's sand, ringed with torches that burned with fluid flames. Geometric symbols crisscrossed in the white sand. In the center of the sand was the boy, buried in an upright position to his neck. Dark and Rawl approached slowly, his hands clasped behind his back. Demon waited off by the trees before the grass. The master stopped at the border of the grass and white sand, looking down at the boy. Dark and Rawl smiled. What is your name, my son? The boy's lower lip quivered as he looked up at Rawl. His eyes shifted to the big man back by the trees. It was a fearful look. Rahl turned and looked to the commander. Leave us, and please take my guards with you. I wish not to be disturbed. Demon bowed his head and left, the guards following. Dark and Rahl turned back, regarding the boy, then lowered himself to sit on the grass. He rearranged his robes once on the ground and smiled again at the boy. Better? The boy nodded. His lips still quivered. Are you afraid of that big man? The boy nodded. Did he hurt you? Did he touch you where he shouldn't? The boy shook his head. His eyes, reflecting a mix of fear and anger, stayed locked on Rawl. 
An ant crawled from the white sand onto his neck. What is your name? Raoul asked again. The boy did not answer. The master watched his brown eyes closely. Do you know who I am? Dark and Raoul, the boy answered in a weak voice. Raoul smiled indulgently. Father Raoul, he corrected. The boy stared at him. I want to go home. The ant inspected its way across his chin. Of course you do, Raoul said with a tone of sympathy and concern. Please believe me, I'm not going to harm you. You are simply here to help me with an important ceremony. You are an honored guest, meant to represent the innocence and strength of youth. You were selected because people told me what a fine boy you are, what a very good boy you are. Everyone has spoken highly of you. They tell me you are smart and strong. Do they speak the truth? The boy hesitated, his shy eyes looking away. Well, I guess they do. He looked back to Rawl. But I miss my mother, and I want to go home. The ant went in a circle around his cheek. Dark and Rawl stared off wistfully and nodded. I understand. I miss my mother also. She was such a wonderful woman, and I loved her so. She took good care of me. When I would do a chore that pleased her, she would make me a special supper, whatever I wanted. The boy's eyes got bigger. My mother does that, too. My father, mother, and I had wonderful times together. We all loved each other very much and had fun together. My mother had a merry laugh. When my father would tell a boastful story, she would poke fun at him, and the three of us would laugh, sometimes until we got tears in our eyes. The boy's eyes brightened. He smiled a little. Why do you miss her? Is she gone away? No, Raoul sighed. She and my father died a few years ago. They were both old. They both had a good life together, but I still miss them. So I understand how you miss your parents. The boy nodded a little. His lip had stopped quivering. The ant walked up the bridge of his nose. He scrunched up his face, trying to get it off. Let's just try to have as good a time as we can for now, and you will be back with him before you know it. The boy nodded again. My name is Carl. Raoul smiled. Honored to meet you, Carl. He reached out and carefully picked the ant off the boy's face. Thanks, Carl said with relief. That's what I'm here for, Carl. To be your friend and help you in any way I can. If you're my friend, then dig me up and let me go home. His eyes glistened wetly. Soon enough, my son, soon enough. I wish I could right now, but the people expect me to protect them from evil people who would kill them. So I must do what I can to help. You are going to be a part of that help. You are going to be an important part of the ceremony that will save your mother and father from the evil ones who would kill them. You do want to protect your mother from harm, don't you? The torches flickered and hissed, as Carl thought. Well, yes, but I want to go home. His lip began quivering again. Dark and Raoul reached out and stroked the boy's hair reassuringly, combing it back with his fingers, then smoothing it down. I know, but try to be brave. I won't let anyone harm you, I promise. I will guard you and keep you safe. He gave Carl a warm smile. Are you hungry? Would you like something to eat? Carl shook his head. All right, then. It is late. I will leave you to rest. He stood, straightening his robes, brushing off grass. Father Rall? Rall stopped and looked back down. Yes, Carl? A tear rolled down Carl's cheek. I'm afraid to be here alone. Could you stay with me? The master regarded the boy with a comforting expression. Why, of course, my son. Father Rawl lowered himself back down to the grass. For as long as you want, even all night if you want me. Chapter 20 Green light glowed all about as they cautiously shuffled their feet through the rubble of the hillside, climbing over or under tree trunks, kicking limbs aside when necessary. 
The iridescent green sheet of the boundary walls pressed against them from both sides as they groped their way ahead. Blackness lay thick all about except for the uncanny illumination that made them feel as if they were in a cave. Richard and Kalin had come to the same decision at the same time. No choice had been left to the two of them. They couldn't go back and they couldn't stay at the split rock, not with the grippers and shadow things coming for them, and so they were forced ahead into the narrows. Richard had put the nightstone away. It was useless for following the trail as there was no trail to follow, and it made it difficult to tell where the boundary light changed to the green wall. He hadn't put it back into its leather pouch, in case it was needed again in a hurry, but had simply dropped it into his pocket. Let the walls of the boundary show us the way, he had said, his quiet voice echoing back from the blackness. Go slow. If one wall turns dark, don't take another step, go a little more to the other side. That way we can stay between them and get through the pass. Kalin had not hesitated, the grippers and shadows being a sure death. She had taken Richard's hand as they had stepped back into the green glow. Shoulder to shoulder they had entered the invisible passage. Richard's heart pounded. He tried not to think about what it was they were doing, walking blindly between the walls of the boundary. He knew what the boundary looked like from when he had been close to it with Chase, and again when the dark thing had tried to pull Kalin in. He knew that if they stepped into the dark wall, there would be no return, but that if they could stay in the green glow before the wall, then they at least had a chance. Kalin stopped. She pushed him to the right. She was close to the wall. Then it appeared on his right. They centered themselves and continued forward, finding that if they went slowly, carefully, they could stay between the walls, walking a thin line of life with death to each side. Years of being a guide were of no help to him, Richard finally stopped trying to find a trace of the trail and let himself feel the force of the walls pressing from each side, let the pressure be his guide. It was slow going, with no sign of the trail in sight, no view of the hillside around them, only the tight world of the luminous green light, like a bubble of life floating helplessly through an endless sea of darkness and death. Mud sucked at his boots, fear at his mind. Any obstacle they encountered had to be crossed. They couldn't go around. The boundary walls dictated where they went. Sometimes it was over fallen trees, sometimes over boulders, sometimes through washouts, where they had to use exposed roots to pull themselves up the other side. They helped each other silently, giving only a squeeze of the hand for encouragement. Never was there more than a step or two to either side of their way that didn't bring up the dark walls. Each time the trail turned the dark wall appeared, sometimes, several times, until they could decipher which way it turned. Each time the wall loomed up, they pulled back as quickly as possible, and each time it scared him with a cold jolt. Richard realized his shoulders ached. The tension of what they were doing was making his muscles tighten, his breathing shallow. He relaxed, took a deep breath, let his arms hang loose, shook his wrists to ease the stress away, and then took Kalin's hand again. He smiled down at her face, lit by the haunting green light. She smiled back, but he could see the controlled terror in her eyes. At least, he thought, the bones were keeping the shadow things and the beasts away from them. And nothing appeared beyond the walls when they accidentally encountered them. Richard could almost feel his will to live draining from his soul with each careful step. Time took on an abstract dimension, holding no solid meaning. He could have been in the narrows for hours or days he had trouble telling anymore. He found himself wishing only for peace, for it to be over, to be safe again. His fear was beginning to dull from the sheer level of tension he had maintained as they probed their way ahead. Movement caught his attention. He looked behind. Shadow things, a flush of green light around each, floated in a line between the walls close at their backs, following the two of them down the path, skimming above the ground each lifting in turn to pass over a tree trunk that lay across the way. Richard and Kalin stopped, frozen, watching. The shadows didn't stop. Lead the way, he whispered, and keep hold of my hand, I'll watch them. He could see that her shirt was soaked with sweat, same as his, even though it wasn't a warm night. Without so much as a nod, she started off. He walked backward, his back to hers, his eyes to the shadows, his mind in a panic. Kalin went as fast as she could, having to stop and change direction several times. 
pulling him after by the hand. She stopped again, at last groping her way to the right, when the unseen path made a sharp turn down the hill. Walking backward downhill was difficult. He stepped carefully to avoid falling. The shadows followed in a single file, turning with the path. Richard resisted his urge to tell Kaylin to go faster, as he didn't want her to make a mistake, but the shadows were getting closer. It would only be a matter of minutes before they closed the distance, before they were on him. Muscles tense, his hand gripped the hilt of his sword. He debated in his mind whether or not to draw it, not knowing if it could help them, or if it would bring them to harm. Even if the sword worked against the shadows, a fight in the confines of the narrows would be a big risk at best. But if there was no choice, if they came too close, he would have to use the sword. The shadows seemed as if they had taken on faces. Richard tried to remember if they had faces before, but couldn't. His fingers gripped the hilt of the sword tighter as he walked backward, Kalen's soft hand warm in his. The faces appeared sad, gentle in the green glow. They regarded him with kind, pleading countenances. The raised lettering of the word truth on the sword seemed to burn painfully into his fingers as he clutched it tighter. Anger seeped from the sword, searching his mind, searching for his own anger, but finding only fear and confusion, the anger wilted. The forms no longer gained on him, but paced along, keeping him company in the lonely darkness. Somehow they made him feel less afraid, less tense. Their whispers calmed him. Richard's hand relaxed on the sword as he strained to make out the words. The slow, easy smiles reassured him, gentled his caution his alarm, making him want to hear more, to understand the murmurs. Green light around the faint forms shimmered comfortingly. His heart pounded with the need for rest, for peace, for their company. Like the shadows, his mind drifted smoothly, quietly, gently. Richard thought of his father, longed for him. He remembered joyful, easy times with him, times of love, sharing, caring, times of safety when nothing threatened him, nothing frightened him, nothing worried him. He longed for those times again. He realized that that was what the whispers were saying, that it could be like that again. They wanted to help him reach that place again, that was all. Small warnings burgeoned deep in his mind, but then withered and were gone. His hand slipped from the sword. He had been so wrong, so blind, and hadn't been able to see it before. They weren't there to harm him, but to help him reach the peace he wanted. It wasn't what they wanted, but what he wanted. That's what they offered him. They wished only to help release him from loneliness. A wistful smile spread on his lips. How could he have not seen it before? How could he have been so blind? Whispers like sweet music washed over him in gentle waves, soothing his fears, giving him soft light in the dark places of his mind. He stopped walking so that he wouldn't step out of the bathing warmth, of the enchanting murmurs, the breath of the music. A cold hand tugged annoyingly at his, trying to pull him on, so he released it. It went without objection, to bother him no more. The shadows drifted closer. Richard waited for them, watched their gentle faces, listened to their soft whispers. When they sighed his name, it made him shudder with pleasure. He welcomed them as they came around in a comforting circle floating closer, their hands reaching to him as they did so. Hands lifted to his face, almost touching him, seeking to caress him. He looked from one face to another, meeting the eyes of his saviors, each holding his gaze in turn, each whispering a promise of wonderment. A hand almost brushed his face, and he thought he felt searing pain but wasn't sure. The keeper of the hand promised that he would feel pain no more after he joined with them. He wanted to speak, to ask them so many questions, but it seemed so suddenly unimportant, so trivial. He had only to give himself over to their care and everything would be all right. He turned to each, offering himself to each, waiting to be taken. Page 199. As he turned, he looked for Kaylin, thinking to take her with him, to share the peace with her. Memories of her flamed into his mind, distracting his attention even though the whispers told him to ignore them. He scanned the hillside, peering off into the dark rubble. Faint light tinged the sky, morning materializing. Black voids of the trees ahead stood against the pale pink sky. He was almost to the end of the slide. He didn't see Kalen anywhere. 
The shadows whispered insistently to him, calling his name. Memories of Kalin blazed brightly into his mind. Sudden choking fear flamed up inside him, burning the whispers in his mind to ash. Kalin! he screamed. There was no answer. Dark hands, dead hands reached for him. The faces of the shadows wavered like vapors rising from boiling poison. Gnarled voices called his name. He took a step back, away from them, confused. Kalen! he screamed again. Hands reached for him, bringing searing pain even though they did not touch him. Again he took a step back, away from them. But this time the dark wall was there at his back. The hands extended up to push at him. He looked around for Kalen, bewildered. This time the pain brought him fully awake. Terror raced through him as he realized where he was and what was happening. And then his anger exploded. Heat of rage from the magic surged through him as the sword came free, sweeping in an arc at the shadows. The ones caught by the blade flared into nothingness, the smoke of their forms spinning as if caught in a vortex of wind before coming apart with a howl. More came at him. The sword flashed through them, and still more came as if there were no end to their numbers. As he cut them down on one side, the ones on the other side would reach for him, the pain of their near touch burning into him before he turned with the sword. Richard wondered for an instant what it would feel like if they were able to finally touch him, if he would feel the pain or simply be dead in that moment. He stepped away from the wall, slashing with the sword as he did so. He took another step forward, cutting furiously as he moved, the blade whistling as he swung it. Richard stood, feet dug in, destroying the shadows as fast as they came. His arms ached, his back hurt, his head pounded, sweat poured from his face. He was exhausted. With nowhere to run, he was forced to stand his ground, but he knew he couldn't keep this up forever. Screams and howls filled the night air as the shadows seemed to fall eagerly on his sword. A knot of them rushed forward, forcing him back again before he could slash through them. Again, the dark wall came up at his back. Black forms on the other side of it reached for him while giving out agonizing cries. Too many shadows were coming at once to allow him to step away from the wall. It was all he could do to hold where he was. Pain from the reaching hands was wearing him down. He knew that if they came at him fast enough, and in enough numbers, he would be pushed through the wall into the underworld. He fought on numbly, endlessly. Anger was giving way to panic. The muscles of his arms burned with the effort of swinging the sword. It seemed the shadow's intent was simply to wear him down with their numbers. He realized that he had been right not to use the sword before, that it would bring them to harm. But there had been no choice. He had to use it to save them. But there was no them, he realized. Kalin was nowhere to be found. It was only him. Swinging the sword, he wondered if it had been like this for her, if the shadows had seduced her with their whispers and touched her, forced her into the wall. She had no sword to protect her. That was what he had said he would do. Fury erupted in him anew. The thought of Kalin being taken by the shadows, by the underworld, brought the rage roaring forth again, the magic of the Sword of Truth rising to the summons. Richard cut through the shadows with renewed vengeance. Hatred, flaming into white-hot need, took him ahead through the forms, swinging the sword faster than they could come forward to meet it. So he went to them. Howls of their end joined in a mass cry of anguish. Richard's wrath at what they had done to Kalin drove him forward in a frenzy of violence. Without his realizing it at first, the shadows had stopped moving and instead hovered as Richard continued down the path between the walls, slashing at them. For a time, they made no attempt to avoid his blade, but simply floated in place. Then they began to glide like trailers of smoke in a near still air. They drifted into the walls of the boundary, losing their green glow as they went through to become the dark things on the other side. At last, Richard came to a panting halt, his arms throbbing with weariness. That was what they were. Not shadow people, but the things from the other side of the boundary wall. The things that had been escaping and taking people just as they had tried to take him. Just as they had taken Kalen. A pain from deep inside welled up and tears came to his eyes. Kalen, he whispered into the cool morning air. His heart ached with wrenching agony. She was gone, and it had been his fault. He had let down his guard. He had let her down, had not protected her. 
How could it have happened so fast, so easily? Addie had warned him, warned him that they would call to him. Why hadn't he been more cautious? Why hadn't he paid more attention to her warning? Over and over in his mind, he imagined her fear, her confusion at why he wasn't there with her, her pleading for him to help her, her pain, her death. Desperately, his mind raced as he cried, trying to make time go backward, to do it again differently, to ignore the voices, to keep hold of her hand, to save her. Tears ran down his face as he let the tip of the sword lower and drag on the ground, too tired to put it away as he walked forward in a daze. Rubble of the slide was at an end. The green light faded and was gone as he stepped into the woods and onto the trail. Someone whispered his name, a man's voice. He stopped and looked back. Richard's father stood in the light of the boundary. Son, his father whispered, let me help you. Richard stared woodenly at him. Morning lit the overcast, washing everything in a wet gray light. The only color was the glowing green around his father, who held his hands open. You can't help me, Richard whispered back hoarsely. Yes, I can. She is with us. She is safe now. Richard took a few steps toward his father. Safe? Yes, she is safe. Come, I will take you to her. Richard took a few more steps, dragging the tip of the sword on the ground behind. Tears ran down his cheeks. His chest heaved. You could really take me to her? Yes, son, his father said softly. Come, she waits for you. I will take you to her. Richard walked numbly toward his father. And I can be with her forever? Forever, came the answer in the reassuring, familiar voice. Richard trudged back into the green light to his father, who smiled warmly at him. When he reached him, Richard brought the sword of truth up and ran it through his father's heart. Wide-eyed, his father looked up at him as he was impaled. How many times, dear father, Richard asked through tears and gritted teeth, must I slay your shade? His father only shimmered and then dissolved into the dim morning air. Bitter satisfaction replaced the anger. Then it, too, was gone as he turned once again to the path. Tears ran in streaks through the dirt and sweat on his face. He wiped them on his shirt sleeve as he swallowed back the lump in his throat. Woods enveloped him indifferently as he rejoined the trail. Laboriously, Richard slid his sword home into its scabbard. When he did so, he noticed the light from the nightstone shining through his pocket, it still being just dark enough to cause it to glow weakly. He stopped and took the smooth stone out once more and replaced it in its leather pouch, quenching the dim yellow light. His face set in grim determination, Richard slogged ahead, his fingers reaching up to touch the tooth under his shirt. Loneliness, deeper than he had ever known, sagged his shoulders. All his friends were lost to him. He knew now that his life was not his own. It belonged to his duty, to his task. He was the seeker. Nothing more, nothing less. Not his own man, but a pawn to be used by others. A tool, same as his sword, to help others that they might have the life he had only glimpsed for a twinkling. He was no different from the dark things in the boundary, a bringer of death, and he knew quite clearly who he was going to bring it to. The master sat straight-backed and cross-legged on the grass in front of the sleeping boy, his hands resting palm up on his knees, a smile on his lips, as he thought about what had happened with Confessor Kalin at the boundary. Morning sunlight streamed crossways through the windows overhead, making the colors of the garden flowers vibrant. Slowly, he brought the fingers of his right hand to his lips, licking the tips, and then smoothing his eyebrows before carefully returning the hand to its resting place. Thoughts of what he would do to the mother confessor had caused his breathing to quicken. He slowed it now, returning his mind to the matter at hand. His fingers wiggled, and Carl's eyes popped open. Good morning, my son. Good to see you again, he said in his most friendly voice. The smile, though for another reason, was still on his lips. Carl blinked and squinted at the brightness of the light. Good morning, he said in a groan. Then his eyes, looking about, thought to add, Father Rall. You slept well, Rall assured the boy. You were here? 
Here all night? All night. As I promised you I would be. I would not lie to you, Carl. Carl smiled. Thanks. He lowered his eyes shyly. I guess I was kind of silly to be scared. I don't think it's silly at all. I am glad I could be here to reassure you. My father says I'm being foolish when I get afraid of the dark. There are things in the dark that can get you, Rahl said solemnly. You are wise to know it and to be on guard for them. Your father would do himself a favor to listen and learn from you. Carl brightened. Really? Rahl nodded. Well, that's what I always thought, too. If you truly love someone, you will listen to them. My father always says for me to keep my tongue still. Rahl shook his head disapprovingly. It surprises me to hear this. I had thought they loved you very much. Well, they do, most of the time anyway. I'm sure you are right. You would know better than I. The master's long blonde hair glistened in the morning light. His white robe shone brightly. He waited. There was a long moment of awkward silence. But I do get pretty tired of them always telling me what to do. Rawl's eyebrows went up. You seem to me to be of the age where you can think and decide things for yourself. A fine boy like you, almost a man, and they tell you what to do, he added, half to himself, shaking his head again as if he couldn't believe what Carl was telling him. He asked, You mean they treat you like a baby? Carl nodded his earnest confirmation, then thought to correct the impression. Most of the time, though, they're good to me. Rahl nodded somewhat suspiciously. That is good to hear. It is a relief to me. Carl looked up at the sunlight. But I can tell you one thing. My parents are going to be madder than hornets that I've been gone so long. They get mad because of when you come home? Sure. One time I was playing with a friend and I got home late and my mother was real mad. My father took his belt to me. He said it was for worrying them so. A belt? Your father hit you with his belt? Dark and Rawl hung his head, then came to his feet, turning his back to the boy. I'm sorry, Carl. I had no idea it was like this with them. Well, it's only because they love me. Carl hastened to add. That's what they said. They love me, and I caused them to worry. Rawl still kept his back to the boy. Carl frowned. Don't you think that shows they care about me? Rawl licked his fingers and smoothed them over his eyebrows and lips before he turned back to the boy and sat once more in front of his anxious face. Carl, his voice was so soft that the boy had to strain to hear. Do you have a dog? Sure, he nodded. Tinker. She's a fine dog. I had her since she was a pup. Tinker. Rawl rolled the name out pleasantly. And has Tinker ever been lost or run away? Carl scrunched up his eyebrows, thinking, Well, sure, a couple times before she was grown, but she came back the next day. Were you worried when your dog was gone, when she was missing? Well, sure. Why? Because I love her. I see. And so, then, when Tinker came back the next day, what did you do? I picked her up in my arms and I hugged her and hugged her. You didn't beat Tinker with your belt? No. Why not? Because I love her. But you were worried? Yes. So you hugged Tinker when she came back because you loved her and you were worried about her? Yes. Rahl leaned back a little, his blue eyes intense. I see. And if you had beaten Tinker with your belt when she came back to you, what do you think she would have done? I bet she might not have come back the next time. She wouldn't want to come back so I could beat her. She'd have gone somewhere else where people loved her. I see, Rawl said meaningfully. Tears streamed down Carl's cheeks. He looked away from Rawl's eyes as he cried. At last, Rawl reached out, stroking back the boy's hair. I'm sorry, Carl. I did not mean to upset you. But I want you to know that when this is all over and you go home again, that if you ever need a home, you will always be welcome here. You are a fine boy, a fine young man, and I would be proud to have you stay here with me, both you and Tinker. And I want you to know I trust you to think for yourself, and you may come and go as you please. Carl looked up with wet eyes. Thank you, Father Rawl. 
Rahl smiled warmly. Now, how about some food? Carl nodded his approval. What would you like? We have anything you could want. Carl thought a minute, and a smile came to him. I like blueberry pie. It's my favorite. He cast his eyes down, the smile fading. But I'm not allowed to have it for breakfast. A big grin came to Darken Rawls' face. He stood. Blueberry pie it is, then. I'll go get it and be right back. The master walked off through the garden to a small vine-covered door at the side. The door opened for him as he approached, the big arm of Demon Nass holding it back as Rahl passed through into the dark room. Foul-smelling gruel boiled in an iron kettle hung over a fire in a small forge. The two guards stood silently against the far wall, a sheen of sweat covering them. Master Rahl, Demon bowed his head, I trust the boy meets with your approval. Rahl licked his fingertips. He will do nicely. He smoothed his eyebrows down. Dish me out a bowl of that slop so it can cool. Demon picked up a pewter bowl and started ladling gruel into it with the wooden spoon from the kettle. If everything is all right, a wicked grin came over his pockmarked face. Then I will be off to pay our respects to Queen Melena. Fine. On the way, Stop and tell the dragon I want her. Damon stopped ladling. She doesn't like me. She doesn't like anyone, Rahl said flatly. But don't worry, Damon. She will not eat you. She knows what I will do if she stretches my patience. Damon started ladling again. She will ask how soon you will need her. Rahl glanced at him out of the corner of his eye. That is none of her concern. And tell her I said so. She is to come when I ask and wait until I am ready. He turned and looked out a small slit off through the foliage at the side of the boy's head. But I want you back here in two weeks. Two weeks, all right. Demon set the bowl of gruel down. But does it really need to take that long with the boy? It does if I want to return from the underworld. Raoul continued to look out the slit. It may take longer. Whatever it takes, it takes. I must have his complete trust, the freely given pledge of his unconditional loyalty. Demon hooked a thumb in his belt. We have another problem. Rahl glanced back over his shoulder. Is that all you do, Demon? Go around looking for problems. It keeps my head attached to my shoulders. Rahl smiled. So it does, my friend, so it does, he sighed. Get it off your tongue, then. Demon shifted his weight to his other foot. Last night I received reports that the tracer cloud has vanished. Vanished? Well, not so much vanished as hidden. He scratched the side of his face. They said clouds moved in and hid it. Raoul laughed. Demon frowned in confusion. Our friend, the old wizard, it sounds like he saw the cloud and has been up to his little tricks to vex me. It was to be expected. This one is not a problem, my friend. It is not important. Master Rall, that was how you were to find the book. Other than the last box, what could be more important? I did not say the book was unimportant. I said the cloud was unimportant. The book is very important. That is why I would not trust it only to a tracer cloud. Damon, how do you suppose I hooked the cloud to the cipher boy? My talents lie in areas other than magic, Master Rall. True enough, my friend. Rall licked his fingertips. Many years ago, before my father was murdered by that evil wizard, he told me of the boxes of Orden and the Book of Counted Shadows. He was trying to recover them himself, but he was not well enough studied. He was too much a man of action, of battle. Rahl looked up into Demon's eyes. Much the same as you, my big friend. He didn't have the necessary knowledge, but he was wise enough to teach me the value of the head over the sword, how by using your head you could defeat any number of men. He had the best instructors tutor me. Then he was murdered. Raoul pounded his fist down on the table. His face turned red. After a moment, he calmed himself. So I studied harder for many years so that I might succeed where my father failed. 
and return the house of Raal to its rightful place as rulers of all the lands. You have exceeded your father's deepest hopes, Master Raal. Raal smiled his slight smile. He took another look through the slit as he went on. In my studies, I found where the Book of Counted Shadows lay hidden. It was in the Midlands, on the other side of the boundary. But I was not yet able to travel the underworld to go there and retrieve it. So I sent a guard beast to watch over it for me until the day when I could go myself and liberate it. He stood up, turning back to Demon, a dark look on his face. Before I could get the book, a man named George Cipher killed the guard beast and stole the book. My book. He took a tooth from the beast as a trophy. A very stupid thing to do, as the beast was sent by magic. My magic. He lifted an eyebrow. And I can find my magic. Raal licked his fingers, stroking them over his lips, staring off absently. After I put the boxes of Orden in play, I went to get the book. That's when I found it had been stolen. It took time, but I found the man who stole it. Unfortunately, he no longer had the book and would not tell me where it was. Raal smiled up at Demon. I made him suffer for not helping me. Demon smiled back. But I did learn that he had given the tooth to his son. So that is how you know the cipher boy has the book? Yes. Richard Cipher has the Book of Counted Shadows. And he also wears the tooth. That's how I hooked the tracer cloud to him, by hooking it to the tooth his father gave him, the tooth with my magic. I would have recovered the book before now, but I have had many matters to attend to. I only hooked the cloud to him to help me keep track of him in the meantime. It was a mere convenience. But the matter is as good as settled. I can get the book at any time of my choosing. The cloud is of little importance. I can find him by the tooth. Raal picked up the bowl of gruel, handing it to Demon. Taste this. See if it is cool enough. He arched an eyebrow. I wouldn't want to hurt the boy. Demon sniffed the bowl, his nose turning up in distaste. He handed it to one of the guards, who took it without objection, and put a spoon of gruel to his lips. He gave a nod. Cipher could lose the tooth, or simply throw it away. Then you would not be able to find him or the book. Demon gave a submissive bow of his head as he spoke. Please forgive me for saying so, Master Rao, but it would seem to me you leave a lot to chance. Sometimes, Demon, I leave things to fate, but never to chance. I have other ways of finding Richard Cipher. Demon took a deep breath, relaxing as he thought about Raoul's words. I can see now why you haven't been worried. I didn't know all this. Raoul frowned up at his loyal commander. We have scarcely stroked the fur of what you do not know, Demon. That is why you serve me and not me you. His expression softened. You have been a good friend, Demon, since we were boys, so I will ease your mind on this subject. I have many pressing matters that require my time, matters of magic that cannot wait. Like this. His arm went out, indicating the boy. I know where the book is, and I know my own talents. I can get the book at a time of my convenience, for now I look upon it as if Richard Cipher is simply keeping it safe for me. Raw leaned closer. Satisfied? Demon diverted his eyes to the ground. Yes, Master Rall. He looked back up. Please know that I only bring my concerns to you because I want success for you. You are rightfully the master of all the lands. We all need you to guide us. I wish only to be part of delivering you victory. I fear nothing but that I should fail you. Dark and Rall put his arm around Demon's big shoulders looking up at the pock-marked face, the streak of black hair through the blonde. That I had more like you, my friend. He took his arm away and picked up the bowl. Go now and tell Queen Melena of our alliance. Don't forget to summon the dragon. His hint of a smile came back. And don't let your little diversions make you late in returning. Demon bowed his head. Thank you, Master Rall, for the honor of serving you. The big man left through a back door as Rall went out the one into the garden. The guards stayed in the small hot forge room. Picking up the feeding horn, Rall went over to the boy. 
The feeding horn was a long brass tube, small at the mouthpiece, large at the other end. The big end was held up to shoulder height by two legs, so the gruel would slide down. Rawl set it down so the mouthpiece was in front of Carl. What's this thing? Carl asked, squinting up at it. A horn? Yes, that's right. Very good, Carl. It's a feeding horn. It's a part of the ceremony you will be in. The other young men who have helped the people in the past have thought it a most fun way to eat. You put your mouth over the end there, and I serve you by pouring the food in the top. Carl was skeptical. Really? Yes, Raoul smiled reassuringly. And guess what? I got you a fresh blueberry pie, still warm out of the oven. Carl's eyes lit up. Great! He eagerly put his mouth over the end of the horn. Rawl passed his hand in a circle over the bowl three times to change the taste, then looked down at Carl. I had to mash it up so it will go through the feeding horn. I hope that's all right. I always mash it up with my fork, Carl said with a grin, then put his mouth back over the horn. Rawl poured a little gruel into the end of the horn. When it reached Carl's mouth, he ate it eagerly. It's great! The best I ever had! I'm so pleased, Rawl said with a shy smile. It's my own recipe. I feared it wouldn't be as good as your mother's. It's better. Can I have more? Of course, my son. With Father Rawl, there is always more. Chapter 21 Wearily, Richard searched the ground where the trail resumed at the end of the slide, his hopes fading. Dark clouds scudded low overhead, occasionally bringing a few fat drops of cold rain to splatter on the back of his head as he hunted. It had occurred to him that maybe Kaelin had made it through the narrows, that she had only become separated from him and had continued on. She was wearing the bone Addie had given her, and it should have kept her safe. She should have been able to make it through. But he was wearing the tooth, and Addie had said he couldn't be seen either, yet the shadows had come for them anyway. It seemed odd. The shadows hadn't moved until it was dark at the split rock. Why didn't they come for them before? There were no tracks. Nothing had been through the narrows for a long time. Fatigue and despair enveloped him again as fits of icy wind flapped his forest cloak around him, seeming to urge him on away from the narrows. All hope gone, he turned once more to the path, toward the Midlands. He had taken only a few steps when a thought brought him to a sudden halt. If Kalin had become separated from him, if she thought the underworld had taken him, if she had thought she had lost him and was alone, would she have continued on to the Midlands, alone? No. He turned to the Narrows. No. She would have gone back, back to the wizard. It would be no use for her to go to the Midlands alone. She needed help. That's why she had come to Westland in the first place. Without the Seeker, the only help was the wizard. Richard dared not put too much faith in the thought, but it wasn't that far back to the place where he had fought the shadows, where he had lost her. He couldn't go on without checking, without knowing for sure. Fatigue forgotten, he plunged back into the narrows. Green light welcomed his return. Following his tracks back, in a short time he found the place where he had fought the shadows. His footprints wandered all about in the mud of the slide, telling the tale of his battle. He was surprised at how much ground he had covered in the fight. He didn't remember all the circling, the back and forth. But then he didn't remember much of the fight until the last part. With a jolt of recognition, he saw what he was looking for, the tracks of the two of them together, then hers alone. His heart pounded as he followed them, hoping so hard it hurt that they wouldn't lead into the wall. Squatting, he inspected them, touched them. Her tracks wandered about a while, seeming confused, and then they stopped and turned. Where their pair of tracks led in from the other way, one set of tracks led back. Kalins. Richard stood in a rush, his breathing rapid, his pulse racing. The green light glowed irritatingly about him. He wondered how far she could have gone. It had taken them most of the night to laboriously cross the narrows, but they hadn't known where the trail was. He looked down at the footprints in the mud. He did now. He would have to go fast. He couldn't be timid in following the way back. A memory of something Zed had told him when the old man had given him the sword came into his mind. 
The strength of rage, the wizard had said, gives you the heedless drive to prevail. The clear metallic ringing filled the dim morning as the seeker drew his sword. Anger flooded through him. Without a second thought, Richard dashed down the trail following the tracks. The pressure of the wall buffeted him as he jogged through the cool mist. When the tracks turned, switching back and forth, he didn't slow but set his feet to one side or the other to throw his weight the other way down the path. Keeping a steady, sustainable pace, he was able to traverse the span of the narrows before mid-morning. Twice he had come across a shadow floating in place on the path. They didn't move or seem to be aware of him. Richard charged through, sword first. Even without faces, they had seemed surprised as they howled apart. Without slowing, he went through the split rock, kicking a gripper out of the way. On the other side, he stopped to catch his breath. He was overwhelmed with relief that her footprints went all the way. Now, back on the forest trail, her tracks would be harder to see, but it didn't matter. He knew where she was going, and he knew she was safely through the narrows. He felt like crying with joy in the knowledge that Kalin was alive. He knew he was getting closer to her. The mist hadn't yet had time to soften the sharp edges of her footprints the way it had when he had first found them. When it had gotten light, she must have followed their tracks instead of using the walls to show the way, or else he would have caught her long before now. Good girl, he thought, using your head. He would make a woodswoman of her yet. Richard trotted off down the trail, keeping the sword and his anger out. He didn't waste time to stop and look for signs of her trail. But whenever there was a soft or muddy patch, he looked down, checking as he slowed a little. After running over an area of mossy ground, he came to a small bare patch with footprints. He gave a cursory glance as he went by. Something he saw made him stop so suddenly that he fell. On his hands and knees, he peered down at the prints. His eyes widened. Overlapping part of her footprint was a man's boot print, nearly three times as large as hers. He knew without a doubt who it belonged to the last man of the quad. Rage brought him to his feet, scrambling into a dead run. Branches and rock flashed by in a blur. His only concern was to stay on the trail and avoid accidentally running into the boundary, not out of fear for himself, but because he knew he couldn't help Kalin if he got himself killed. His lungs burned for air as his chest heaved with exertion. The anger of the magic made him ignore his exhaustion, his lack of sleep. Clambering to the top of a small jut of rock, he saw her at the bottom of the other side. For an instant, he froze. Kalin stood on the left, feet apart, in a half crouch, a rock wall at her back. The last man of the quad stood in front of her to Richard's right. Panic slashed through his anger. The man's leather uniform glistened in the wet. The hood of his chainmail shirt covered his head of blonde hair. His sword rose in his massive fists, and muscles stood out in knots along his arms. He howled a battle cry. He was going to kill her. Wrath exploded through Richard's mind. He screamed, No! in a murderous rage as he leapt off the rock. With both hands, he brought the Sword of Truth up while still in midair. When he hit the ground, he recoiled, swinging it around from behind in an arc. The sword whistled with its speed. The man had turned as Richard hit the ground. Seeing Richard's sword coming, he brought his own up defensively with lightning speed, the tendons in his wrists and hands making a popping sound as he did so. Richard watched as if in a dream as his sword came around. Every ounce of his strength went into trying to make the sword go faster, go truer, be deadlier. The magic raged with his need. Richard looked from the man's sword hard into the steel-blue eyes. The seeker's sword followed the track of his eyes. He heard himself still screaming. The man held his sword straight up to deflect the blow. Everything else around the man dissolved in Richard's vision. His anger, the magic, was unleashed like never before. No power on earth could deny him the man's blood. Richard was beyond all reason, beyond all other need, beyond all other cause for living. He was death brought to life. Richard's entire life force focused lethal hatred into the drive of his sword. With a beat of his heart that he could feel in the straining muscles of his neck, Richard watched out of his peripheral vision with expectant elation as he held the man's blue eyes, watched his sword finally sweep the rest of the agonizing distance around in a smooth arc, at long last contacting the enemy's raised sword. 
He saw the detail of it shattering ever so slowly in a burst of hot fragments, freeing the bulk of the severed blade to lift into the air, twisting as it went, its polished surface glinting in the light with a flash upon each of the three revolutions it made before the Seeker's sword, with all the power of his rage and the magic behind it, reached the man's head, contacting the chain mail, making the head deflect only the tiniest bit before the sword exploded through the steel links of the mail, through the man's head at eye level, filling the air with a shower of steel pieces and links. The misty morning erupted with a burst of red fog that made Richard feel a flush of exhilaration as he watched clumps of blonde hair and bone and brain tumble madly away as the blade continued its sweep through the crimson air, clearing the last ragged fragments of the enemy's skull, continuing its journey around while the body, with only a neck and jaw and little else recognizable above that, began dropping away as if all its bones had dissolved, leaving nothing to hold it up, finally hitting the ground with a hard jolt. Globs of blood were flung up into the air in long strings, which finally arced and fell back to the ground and onto Richard, offering the victor the hot, satisfying taste of it in his mouth where some of it had landed as he screamed his rage. More pumped thick and copious out into the dirt at the same time as bits of steel from the chain mail and shattered sword rained to earth, while other bits of bone and steel that had already flown past Richard bounced and skittered across the rock behind him, and still more bone and brain and blood from up in the air fell back at last onto the ground all about, tinting everything a rich red. The bringer of death stood victorious over the object of his hate and rage, soaked in blood and the glory of joy such as he had never imagined. His chest heaved in rapture. Bringing the sword to the front again, he checked for any other threat. There was none. And then the world imploded upon him. Everything about jolted back into his sight. Richard saw a wide-eyed look of shock on Kalin's face before the pain took him to his knees, ripping through him, doubling him over. The sword of truth dropped from his hands. Sudden realization of what he had done slashed through him. He had killed a man. Worse, he had killed a man he had wanted to kill. It didn't matter that he was protecting another life. He had wanted to kill, had reveled in it. He would have allowed nothing to deny him the killing. The vision of his sword exploding through the man's head flashed over and over in his mind. He couldn't make it stop. In searing pain like none he had ever known, he clutched his arms across his abdomen. His mouth was open, but no scream came forth. He tried to let himself lose consciousness to stop the pain, but could not. Nothing else existed but the pain, just as nothing else had existed in his desire to kill but the man. The pain whited his vision out. He was blind. Fire burned through every muscle, bone, and organ of his body, consuming him, taking his breath from his lungs, choking him in convulsing agony. He fell to his side on the ground, his knees pulled up to his chest, the screams coming at last in pain now as he had screamed in rage before. Richard felt the life being drawn from him. Through the anguish and hurt, he knew that if this went on, he wasn't going to be able to retain his sanity, or worse, his life. The power of the magic was crushing him. He could never have imagined that this level of pain existed. Now he couldn't imagine it ever leaving. He felt it stripping his sanity from him. In his mind, he begged for death. If something didn't change, and quick, he would have it one way or another. In the fog of agony, a realization came to him. He recognized the pain. It was the same as the anger. It coursed through him the same way as the anger from the sword. He knew that feeling well enough. It was the magic. Once he recognized it as the magic, he urgently tried to take control of it, the way he had learned to control the anger. This time, he knew he must win control or die. He reasoned with himself came to comprehend the need of what he had done, horrible as it was. The man had sentenced himself to death with his own intent to kill. At last, he was able to put away the pain as he had learned to put away the anger. Relief washed over him. He had won both battles. The pain lifted and was gone. Lying on his back, panting, he felt the world come rushing back. Kalin was kneeling beside him, wiping a cool, damp cloth over his face wiping off the blood. Her brow was wrinkled. Tears ran down her cheeks. Splatters of the man's blood lay in long streaks across her face. Richard rose to his knees and took the cloth from her hand to wipe her face, as if to wipe from her mind the sight of what he had done. Before he could, 
She threw her arms around him, embracing him tighter than he would have thought her capable of. He hugged her back just as tight while her fingers went up the back of his neck into his hair, holding his head to her as she cried. He couldn't believe how good it felt to have her back. He didn't want to let her go, ever. I'm so very sorry, Richard, she sobbed. For what? That you had to kill a man on my account. He rocked her gently, stroking her hair. It's all right. She shook her head against his neck. I knew how much the magic would hurt you. That's why I didn't want you to have to fight the men back at the inn. Zed told me the anger would protect me from the pain. Kalen, I don't understand. There is absolutely no way I could have been any more angry. She separated from him, her hands on his arms, squeezing as if to keep testing that he was real. Zed told me to watch out for you if you used the sword to kill a man. He told me that what he said about the anger protecting you was true, but he said the first time was different, that the magic tested, took a measure of the seeker with the pain, and nothing could protect you from it. He said that he couldn't tell you because if you knew, it would make you hold back, be more cautious in its use, and that could be disastrous. He said the magic has to join to the seeker with its first ultimate use to ascertain his intent when he kills. She squeezed his arms. He said the magic could do terrible things to you. It tests with the pain to see who will be the master, who the ruled. Richard sat back on his heels, startled. Addie had said the wizard kept a secret from him. This must have been it. Zed must have been very worried and afraid for him. Richard felt sorry for his old friend. For the first time, Richard truly understood the meaning of being seeker in a way no one else but a seeker could. Bringer of death. He understood it now. Understood the magic, how he used it, how it used him, how they were now joined. For better or worse, he would never be the same again. He had tasted fulfillment of his darkest desire. It was done. There was no going back to being as he was before. Richard brought the cloth up and wiped the blood from Kalin's face. I understand. I know now what he was talking about. You were right not to tell me. He touched the side of her face, his voice gentle. I was so afraid you were killed. She put her hand over his. I thought you were dead. One minute I was holding your hand, and then I realized I wasn't. Her eyes filled with tears again. I couldn't find you. I didn't know what to do. The only thing I could think of was to go get Zed, to wait for him to wake, to get him to help me. I thought you were lost to the underworld. I thought that's what happened to you, too. I almost went on alone. He grinned. Seems I have to keep coming back for you. She smiled for the first time since he had found her, then put her arms around him again. Quickly, she pushed away. Richard, we have to get out of here. There are beasts about. They will come for his body. We can't be here when they do. He nodded, turned, picked up his sword and got to his feet. He reached down for her to help her up. She took his hand. The magic ignited in a rage, warning its master. Startled, Richard stared at her in shock, just as the last time when she had touched his hand when he held the sword, the magic had come to life. Only this time, it was stronger. Smiling, she didn't seem to feel anything. Richard forced the anger down. It went with great reluctance. She hugged him once more, a quick hug with her free arm. I still can't believe you are alive. I was so sure I had lost you. How did you get away from the shadows? Kaylin shook her head. I don't know. They were following us, and when we became separated and I went back, I didn't see them anymore. Did you see any? Richard nodded solemnly. Yes, I saw them. And my father again. They came for me, tried to push me into the boundary. Concern came over Kalen's face. Why just you? Why not both of us? I don't know. Last night at the Split Rock and later when they started following us, it must have been me they were after, not you. The bone protected you. The last time at the boundary, they came for everyone but you, she said. What's different this time? Richard thought a moment. I don't know, but we have to get across the pass. We're too tired to have to spend tonight fighting shadows again. We must get to the Midlands before dark, and this time I promise I won't let go of your hand. Kalen smiled and squeezed his hand. I won't let go of yours either. I ran back through the narrows. It didn't take long that way. You up to that? She nodded, and they started running at an easy pace he thought she could keep up. 
As the last time he crossed, no shadows followed, although several floated above the path. And as before, Richard went through them sword first without waiting to find out what they would do. Kalen flinched at their howls. He watched the tracks as he ran, pulling her through the turns, keeping her on the trail. When they were clear of the slide and on the forest path on the other side of the narrows, they slowed to a fast walk to catch their breath. Drizzle wet their faces and hair. Happiness over finding her alive dimmed his worry about the difficulties that lay ahead. They shared bread and fruit as they kept moving. Even though his stomach was grumbling with hunger, he didn't want to stop for anything more elaborate. Richard was still confused by the reaction of the magic when Kalen had taken his hand. Was it something the magic felt in her? Or was the magic reacting to something in his own mind? Was it because he was afraid of her secret? Or was it something more, something the magic itself felt in her? He wished Zed was around so he could ask him what he thought. But then Zed had been there the last time and he hadn't asked him about it then. Was he afraid of what Zed might tell him? After they had eaten a little and the afternoon had worn on, they heard growls off in the woods. Kalen said it was the beasts. They decided to run again, to get clear of the pass as soon as possible. Richard was beyond being tired. He was simply numb as they ran through the thick wood. Light rain on the leaves washed out the sound of their footfalls. Before dark, they came to the edge of a long ridge. Below, the trail descended in a series of switchbacks. They stood at the top of the ridge in the woods as if at the mouth of a cave, looking out over an open grassland swept with rain. Kaylin held herself erect, rigid. I know this place, she whispered. So what is it? It is called the Wilds. We are in the Midlands, she turned to him. I am returned home. He lifted an eyebrow. The place doesn't look that wild to me. It is not named after the land. It is named after those who live in it. After descending the steep ridge, Richard found a small protected spot under a slab of rock, but it wasn't deep enough to keep out all the rain, so he cut pine boughs and leaned them against the jut of rock, making a small, reasonably dry shelter where they could spend the night. Kalen crawled inside, and Richard followed pulling boughs over the entrance, sealing out most of the rain. Both slumped down, wet and exhausted. Kalen took her cloak off and shook off the water. I've never seen it be overcast so long, or rain so much. I can't even remember what the sun looks like. I'm becoming weary of it. Not me, he said quietly. She frowned, so he explained. Remember the snake-like cloud that followed me? The one sent by Rawl to track me? She nodded. Zed cast a wizard's web to bring other clouds to hide it. As long as it's cloudy and we can't see the snake cloud, neither can Rahl. I prefer the rain to darken Rahl. Kalen thought this over. From now on, I will be happier about the clouds. But next time, could you ask him to bring clouds that are not so wet? Richard smiled and nodded. Do you want anything to eat? She asked. He shook his head. I'm too tired. I just want to sleep. Is it safe here? Yes. No one lives near the boundary in the wilds. Addie said we are protected from the beasts, so the heart hounds should not bother us. The sound of steady rain was making him all the more sleepy. They wrapped themselves in their blankets, the night being cold already. In the dim light, Richard could just make out the features of Kaylin's face as she leaned up against the rock wall. The shelter was too small for a fire, and everything too wet anyway. He reached into his pocket, fingering the pouch with the nightstone, considering if he should take it out to see better, but at last decided against it. Kalen smiled over at him. Welcome to the Midlands. You have done as you said you would. You got us here. Now the hard work begins. What would you have us do? Richard's head was throbbing. He leaned back next to her. We need someone with magic who can tell us where the last box is, where to find it, or at least where to look for it. We can't just go running around blindly. We need someone who can point us in the right direction. Who do you know like that? Kalen gave him a sideways glance. We are a long way from anyone who would want to help us. She was avoiding telling him something. His anger jumped. I didn't say they had to want to help us. I said they had to be able to. You just take me to them and I'll worry about the rest. Richard immediately regretted his tone of voice. He leaned his head back against the rock wall and put the anger down. Kalen, I'm sorry. He rolled his head away from her. I've had a hard day, 
Besides killing that man, I had to run my sword through my father again. But the worst of it was I thought my best friend was lost to the underworld. I just want to stop Rawl, to end this nightmare. He turned his face to hers, and she gave him one of her special tight-lipped smiles. Kalin watched his eyes in the near darkness for a few minutes. Not easy being Seeker, she said softly. He smiled back at her. Not easy, he agreed. The mud people, she said at last. They may be able to tell us where to search, but there is no guarantee they will agree to help us. The wilds are a remote part of the Midlands, and the mud people are not used to dealing with outsiders. They have strange customs. They do not care about the problems of others. They wish only to be left alone. If he succeeds, Dark and Rahl will not respect their wishes, he reminded her. Kalin took a deep breath, letting it out slowly. Richard, they can be dangerous. Have you dealt with them before? She nodded. A few times. They do not speak our language, but I speak theirs. Do they trust you? Kalin looked away as she wrapped her blanket tighter. I guess so. She looked up at him from under her eyebrows. But they are afraid of me, and with the mud people, that may be more important than trust. Richard had to bite the inside of his lip to keep from asking why they were afraid of her. How far? I'm not sure exactly where we are in the wilds. I didn't see enough to tell for certain, but I'm sure they are no more than a week to the northeast. Good enough. In the morning we head northeast. When we get there, you must follow my lead, and if I tell you something, you must pay heed. You must convince them to help you, or they will not, sword or no sword. He gave her a nod. She took her hand out from under the blanket and put it on his arm. Richard, she whispered, thank you for coming back for me. I'm sorry for what it cost you. I had to. What good would it do to go to the Midlands without my guide? Kalin grinned. I will try to live up to your expectations. He gave her hand a squeeze before they both lay down. Sleep took him as he thanked the good spirits for protecting her. Chapter 22 Zed's eyes popped open. The aroma of spice soup was thick in the air. Without moving, he looked cautiously about. Chase lay next to him. There were bones hung on the walls, and it was dark outside the window. He looked down at his body. Bones were piled upon him. Without moving, he carefully caused them to rise slowly into the air. Then he silently made them float aside and finally to set down. Making no sound, he rose. He was in a house full of bones, bones of beasts. He turned around. He was surprised to come face to face with a woman just as she also turned around. In a fright, they both screamed and threw their skinny arms into the air. Who are you? he asked, leaning forward, peering into her white eyes. She snatched her crutch just before it toppled over and put it back under her arm. I be Addy, she answered in a raspy voice. You gave me a scare. You awoke sooner than I expected. Zed straightened his robes. How many meals have I missed? he demanded. Scowling, Addie looked him up and down. Too many by the looks of it. A grin creased Zed's cheeks. He in turn eyed Addie from top to bottom. You are a fine-looking woman, he announced. With a bow, he took her hand and kissed it lightly, then stood up proud and straight, holding one bony finger skyward. Zedicus Zul Zaranda, humbly at your whim, my dear lady. He leaned forward. What's wrong with your leg? Nothing. It'd be perfectly fine. No, no, he said with a frown, pointing. Not that one, the other. Addie looked down at the missing foot, then back up to Zed. It does not go all the way to the ground. What be the matter with your eyes? Well, I hope you learned your lesson. You only have one foot left, you know. Zed's frown melted back to a grin. And the problem with my eyes, he said in his thin voice, is that they have been famished, but now they are feasting. Addie smiled a little smile. Would you like a bowl of soup, wizard? I thought you would never ask, sorceress. He followed her as she worked her way across the room to the kettle hanging in the fireplace, and after she had dished out two bowls of soup, carried them to the table. Leaning her crutch against the wall, she sat opposite him and cut a thick slice each of bread and cheese, pushing them across the table to him. Zed bent over and dug right in, but stopped after one swallow of soup and looked up at her white eyes. Richard made this soup, 
he said in an even voice, the second spoonful hanging midway between the bowl and his mouth. Addie tore off a piece of bread and dunked it in the soup as she watched him. That be true. You be fortunate. Mine would not be this good. Zed looked around as he put the spoon down in the bowl. And where is he? Addie took a bite of the bread and chewed, watching Zed. When she had swallowed, she answered. He and the mother, confessor, have gone through the past to the Midlands. Although he knows her only as Kalen, she still hides her identity from him. She went on to tell the wizard the story of how Richard and Kalen had come to her, seeking her help for their stricken friends. Zed picked up the cheese in one hand, the bread in the other, taking alternating bites as he listened to Addie's tale, wincing at hearing that he had been sustained on gruel. He told me to tell you he could not wait for you, she said, but that he knew you would understand. The seeker gave me instructions to pass on to Chase, for him to return and make preparations for when the boundary fails, for the coming of Raoul's horses. He was sorry he did not know what your plan be, but feared he could not wait. Just as well, the wizard said under his breath. My plan does not include him. Zed went back to eating in earnest. When he had finished the soup, he went to the kettle and helped himself to another bowl full. He offered to get Addie more, but she was not yet finished with her first, since she had spent most of the time with her eyes on the wizard. As he sat back down, she pushed more bread and cheese at him. Richard keeps a secret from you, she said in a low voice. If it were not for this business with Raoul, I would not speak of it. But I thought you should know. The light from the lamp lit his thin face and white hair, making him look stark and all the more thin in the sharp shadows. He picked up his spoon, looked down at the soup a moment, then back up at her face. As you well know, we all have secrets. Wizards more than most. If we all knew each other's secrets, it would prove a very strange world. Besides, it would take all the fun out of the telling of them. His thin lips widened in a smile, his eyes sparkled. But I fear no secret of a person I trust, and he has no need to fear mine. It is part of being friends. Addie leaned back in her chair. Her blank white eyes stared at him. Her small smile came back. For his sake, I hope you be right in your trust. I would not want to give a wizard cause to be angry. Zed shrugged. As wizards go, I'm pretty harmless. She studied his eyes in the lamplight. That be a lie, the sorceress whispered in a low rasp. Zed cleared his throat and thought to change the subject. It would seem I owe you thanks for tending to me, dear lady. That be true. And for helping Richard and Kalen. He looked over to Chase, pointing with his spoon. And the boundary warden, too. I am in your debt. Addie's smile widened. Perhaps someday you can return the favor. Zed pushed up the sleeves of his robes and went back to eating the soup, but not quite as voraciously as before. He and the sorceress watched each other. The fire in the hearth crackled, and outside night bugs chirped. Chase slept on. How long have they been gone? Zed asked at last. This be the seventh day he has left you in the boundary warden to my care. Zed finished his meal, pushing the bowl carefully away. He folded his thin hands on the table, looking down as he tapped his thumbs together. The light from the lamp flickered and danced on his mass of white hair. Did Richard say how I was to find him? For a moment, Addie didn't answer. The wizard continued to wait, tapping his thumbs, until at last she spoke. I gave him a night stone. Zed jumped to his feet. You did what? Addie calmly looked up at him. Would you have me send him through the pass at night without a way to see? To be blind in the pass is a sure death. I wanted him to make it through. It'd be the only way for me to help him. The wizard put his knuckles on the table and leaned forward, his wavy white hair falling around his face. And did you warn him? Of course I did. His eyes narrowed. How? With a sorceress's riddle? Addie picked up two apples and tossed one to Zed. He caught it in the air with a silent spell. It floated, spinning slowly, while he continued to glare at the old woman. Sit down, wizard, and stop showing off. She took a bite of her apple, chewing slowly. 
Zed sat down in a huff. I did not want to frighten him. He already be fearful enough. Had I told him what a nightstone could do, he might have been afraid to use it, and the result would have been that the underworld would have had him sure. Yes, I warned him, but with a riddle, so he would figure it out later, after he be through the pass. Zed's stick-like fingers snatched the apple out of the air. Bags, Addy, you don't understand. Richard hates riddles, always has. He considers them an insult to honesty. He won't brook them. He ignores them as a matter of principle. The apple snapped as he took a big bite. He be seeker. That be what seekers do. They solve riddles. Zed held up a bony finger. Riddles of life, not words. There is a difference. Addie set her apple down and leaned forward, putting her hands on the table. A look of concern softened her face. Zed, I was trying to help the boy. I want him to succeed. I lost my foot in the pass. He would have lost his life. If the seeker loses his life, we all lose ours, too. I did not mean him harm. Zed put his apple down and dismissed his anger with a wave of his hand. I know you meant no harm, Eddie. I did not mean to suggest you did. He took Eddie's hands in his. It will be all right. I be a fool, she said bitterly. He told me he disliked riddles, but I never thought more of it. Zed, seek him through the nightstone. See if he has made it through. Zed nodded. He closed his eyes and let his chin sink to his chest as he took three deep breaths. Then he stopped breathing for a long time. From the air about came the low, soft sound of distant wind. Wind on an open plain, lonely, baleful, haunting. The sound of the wind left at last, and the wizard began breathing again. His head came up and his eyes opened. He is in the Midlands. He has made it through the pass. Addy gave a nod of relief. I will give you a bone to carry so that you may go safely through the pass. Will you go after him now? The wizard looked down at the table, away from her white eyes. No, he said in a quiet voice. He will have to handle this, among other things, on his own. As you said, he is the seeker. I have an important task to attend to if we are to stop Dark and Rawl. I hope he can stay out of trouble in the meantime. Secrets? the sorceress asked, smiling her little smile. Secrets? the wizard nodded. I must leave right away. She took one hand out from under his and stroked his leathery skin. It be dark outside. Dark, he agreed. Why not stay the night? Leave with the light. Zed's eyes snapped up, looking at her from under his eyebrows. Stay the night, Addie shrugged as she stroked his hands. It be lonely here sometimes. Well, Zed's impish grin lit his face. As you say, it is dark outside, and I guess it would make more sense to start out in the morning. A sudden frown broke out, wrinkling his brow. This isn't one of your riddles, is it? She shook her head, and his grin came back. I have my wizard's rock along. Could I interest you? Addie's face softened in a shy smile. I would like that very much. She watched him as she sat back, taking a bite of her apple. Zed arched an eyebrow. Naked? Wind and rain bowed the long grass in broad, slow waves as the two of them made their way across the open, flat plain. Trees were few and far between, mostly birch and alder in clusters along streams. Kalin watched the grass carefully. They were near the mud people's territory. Richard followed silently behind, keeping her under his watchful eye as always. She didn't like taking him to the mud people, but he was right. They had to know where to look for the last box, and there was no one else anywhere near who could point them in the right direction. Autumn was wearing on, and their time was dwindling. Still... The mud people might not help them, and then the time would be wasted. Worse, although she knew they probably would not dare to kill a confessor, even one traveling without the protection of a wizard, she had no idea if they would dare to kill the seeker. She had never traveled the Midlands before without a wizard. No confessor did. It was too dangerous. Richard was better protection than Giller, the last wizard assigned her, but Richard was not supposed to be her protection. She was supposed to be his. She couldn't allow him to put his life at risk for her again. He was more important than she to stopping Rawl. 
That was what mattered above all else. She had pledged her life in defense of the seeker, in defense of Richard. She had never meant anything more ardently in her life. If a time came that called for a choice, it must be she who died. The path through the grasses came to two poles, one set to each side of the trail. They were wrapped in skins dyed with red stripes. Richard stopped by the poles, looking up at the skulls fixed atop them. This meant to warn us away, he asked, as he stroked one of the skins. No, they are the skulls of honored ancestors, meant to watch over their lands. Only the most respected are accorded such recognition. That doesn't sound threatening. Maybe they won't be so unhappy to see us after all. Kalin turned to him and lifted an eyebrow. One of the ways you get to be revered by the mud people is by killing outsiders. She looked back at the skulls. But this is not meant as a threat to others. It is simply a tradition of honor among themselves. Richard took a deep breath as he withdrew his hand from the pole. Let's see if we can get them to help us, so they can go on revering their ancestors and keeping outsiders away. Remember what I told you, she warned. They may not want to help. You have to respect that if it is their decision. These are some of the people I am trying to save. I don't want you to hurt them. Kalen, it is not my desire or intention to hurt them. Don't worry, they will help us. It's in their own interest. They may not see it that way, she pressed. The rain had stopped, replaced by a light, cold mist she felt on her face. She pushed the hood of her cloak back. Richard, promise me you won't hurt them. He pushed his hood back also, put his hands on his hips, and surprised her with a little smile out of one side of his mouth. Now I know how it feels. What? she asked, a tone of suspicion in her voice. As he looked down at her, his smile grew. Remember when I had the fever from the snake vine, and I asked you not to hurt Zed? Now I know how you felt when you couldn't make that promise. Kalin looked into his gray eyes, thinking of how much she wanted to stop Rahl, and thought of all those she knew whom he had killed. And now, I know how you must have felt when I could not make that promise. She smiled in spite of herself. Did you feel this foolish for asking? He nodded. When I realized what was at stake, and when I realized what kind of person you were, that you wouldn't do anything to harm anyone unless there was no choice, then I felt foolish for not trusting you. She did feel foolish for not trusting him but she knew he trusted her too much. I'm sorry, she said, the smile still on her lips. I should know you better than that. Do you know how we can get them to help us? She had been to the village of the mud people several times, none of them by invitation. They would never request a confessor. It was a common chore among confessors, paying a professional call on the different peoples of the Midlands. They had been polite enough out of fear, but they had made it clear that they handled their own affairs and did not want outside involvement. They were not a people who would respond to threats. The mud people hold a gathering called a Council of Seers. I have never been allowed to attend, maybe because I am an outsider, maybe because I am a woman. This group divines the answers to questions that affect the village. They will not hold a gathering at sword point. If they are to help us, they must do so willingly. You must win them over. He gazed hard into her eyes. With your help, we can do it. We must. She nodded and turned to the path once more. Clouds hung low and thick above the grassland, seeming to boil slowly as they rolled along in an endless procession. Out on the plains, there seemed to be much more sky than there was anywhere else. It was an overpowering presence, dwarfing the unchanging flat land. Rains had swollen the streams until the churning muddy water pounded and frothed with a roar at the bottoms of the crossing logs that were used as bridges. Kalin could feel the power of the water making the logs shudder under her boots. She stepped carefully as the logs were slippery and there was no hand rope to aid her crossing. Richard offered her his hand to steady her and she was glad for the excuse to take it. She found herself looking forward to the stream crossings to being able to take his hand. But as deeply as it hurt, she couldn't allow herself to encourage his feelings for her. She wished so much she could just be a woman, like any other. But she wasn't. She was a confessor. Still, sometimes, for brief moments, she could forget and pretend. 
She wished Richard would walk next to her, but he instead stayed behind, scanning the countryside, watching out for her. He was in a strange land, taking nothing for granted, seeing threat in everything. In Westland, she had felt the same way, so she understood the feeling. He was putting his life at great peril against Rahl, against things he had never encountered before, and was right to be wary. The wary died quick enough in the Midlands, the unwary faster still. After crossing another stream and plunging back into the wet grass, eight men sprang up suddenly in front of them. Kalin and Richard came to an abrupt halt. The men were wearing animal skins over most of their bodies. Sticky mud that didn't wash away in the rain was smeared over the rest of their skin and faces, and their hair smoothed down with it. Clumps of grass were tied to their arms and to the skins and stuffed under headbands, making them invisible when they had been squatted down. They stood silently in front of the two of them. All wore grim expressions. Kalin recognized several of the men. It was a hunting party of mud people. The eldest, a fit, wiry man she knew as Savadlin, approached her. The others waited, spears and bows relaxed but ready. Kalin could feel Richard's presence close behind her. Without turning, she whispered for him to stay calm and do as she did. Savadlin stopped in front of her. Strength to Confessor Kalin, he said. Strength to Savadlin and the mud people, she answered in their language. Savadlin slapped her across the face, hard. She slapped him back just as hard. Instantly, Kalin heard the ringing sound of Richard's sword being pulled free. She spun on her heels. No, Richard. He had the sword up, ready to strike. No. She grabbed his wrists. I told you to stay calm and do as I do. His eyes flicked from Savadlin's to hers. They were filled with unleashed anger, the magic that was ready to kill. The muscles in his jaw flexed as he clenched his teeth. And if they slit your throat, would you have me let them slit mine as well? That is the way they greet people. It is meant to show respect for another's strength. He frowned, hesitating. I'm sorry I did not warn you. Richard, put the sword away. His eyes went from hers to Savadlin, and then back to hers again, before he yielded and angrily thrust the sword back into its scabbard. Relieved, she turned back to the mud people as Richard stepped up protectively next to her. Savadlin and the others had been watching calmly. They didn't understand the words, but they seemed to grasp the meaning of what had happened. Savadlin looked away from Richard to Kalin. He spoke in his dialect. Who is this man with the temper? His name is Richard. He is the seeker of truth. Whispers broke out among the other members of the hunting party. Savadlin's eyes sought Richard's. Strength to Richard, the seeker. Kalin told him what Savadlin had said. There was still a hot look on his face. Savadlin stepped up and hit Richard, not with an open hand as he had hit her, but with his fist. Immediately, Richard unleashed a powerful blow of his own that knocked Savadlin from his feet and sent him sprawling on his back. He lay dazed on the ground with his limbs strewn awkwardly out. Fists tightened on weapons. Richard straightened, giving the men a dangerous look that kept them rooted firmly in place. Savadlin propped himself up on one hand, rubbing his jaw with the other. A grin spread across his face. None has ever shown such respect for my strength. This is a wise man. The other men broke out in laughter. Kalin held her hand over her mouth, trying to hide her own. The tension evaporated. What did he say? Richard demanded. He said you have great respect for him, that you are wise. I think you have made a friend. Savadlin held his hand out for Richard to help him up. Warily, Richard complied. Once on his feet, Savadlin slapped Richard on the back, putting an arm around his big shoulders. I am truly glad you recognize my strength, but I hope you do not come to respect me any more. The men laughed. Among the mud people, you shall be known as Richard with the temper. Kalin tried to hold back her laughter while she translated. The men were still snickering. Savadlin turned to them. Maybe your men would like to greet my big friend and have him show you his respect for your strength. They all held their hands out in front of themselves and shook their heads vigorously. No, one of them said between fits of laughter. He has already shown you enough respect for all of us. He turned back to Kalin. As always, Confessor Kalin is welcome among the mud people. Without looking over, he gave a nod of his head, indicating Richard. Is he your mate? 
No. Savadlin tensed. Then you have come here to choose one of our men? No, she said, her voice regaining its calmness. Savadlin looked greatly relieved. The Confessa chooses dangerous traveling companions. Not dangerous to me, only to those who would think to harm me. Savadlin smiled and nodded, then looked Kalin up and down. You wear odd things, different from before. Underneath, I am the same as before, Kalin said, as she leaned a little closer to make her point. That is what you need to know. Savadlin backed away a little from her intense expression and gave a nod. His eyes narrowed. And why are you here? So that we might help each other. There is a man who would rule your people. The Seeker and I would have you rule yourselves. We came seeking your people's strength and wisdom to aid us in our fight. Father Al, Savadlin announced knowingly. You know of him? Savadlin nodded. A man came. He called himself a missionary, said he wanted to teach us of the goodness of one called Father Ral. He talked to our people for three days until we became tired of him. It was Kalin's turn to stiffen. She glanced to the other men who had started smiling at the mention of the missionary. She looked back to the elder's mud-streaked face. And what happened to him after the three days? He was a good man, Savadlin smiled meaningfully. Kalin straightened herself. Richard leaned closer to her. What are they saying? They want to know why we are here. They said they have heard of Dark and Rahl. Tell them I want to talk to their people, that I need them to call a gathering. She looked up at him from under her eyebrows. I am getting to that. Addie was right. You are not a patient person. Richard smiled. No, she was wrong. I am very patient. But I am not very tolerant. There is a difference. Kalen smiled at Savadlin as she spoke to Richard. Well, please do not become intolerant just now or show them any more respect for the moment. I know what I am doing, and it is going well. Let me do it my way, all right? He agreed, folding his arms in frustration. She turned once more to the elder. He peered at her sharply and asked something that surprised her. Did Richard with the temper bring us the reins? Kalen frowned. Well, I guess you could say that. She was confused by the question and didn't know what to say, so told him the truth. The clouds follow him. The elder studied her face intently and nodded. She didn't feel comfortable under his gaze and sought to bring the conversation back to the reason for her visit. Savadlin, the seeker has come to see your people on my advice. He is not here to harm or interfere with your people. You know me. I have been among you before. You know of my respect for the mud people. I would not bring another to you unless it was important. Right now, time is our enemy. Savadlin considered what she had said for a while, then at last spoke. As I said before, you are welcome among us. He looked up with a grin at the seeker, then back to her. Richard with the temper is most welcome in our village, too. The other men were pleased with the decision. They all seemed to like Richard. They gathered up their things, including two deer and a wild boar, each tied to a carrying pole. Kalin hadn't seen the result of their hunt before, because it had been hidden in the tall grass. As they all started off down the path, the men gathered about Richard, touching him cautiously and jabbering questions he couldn't understand. Savadlin clapped him on the shoulders, looking forward to showing off his big new friend to the village. Kalin went along beside him, for the most part ignored and happy that so far they liked Richard. She understood the feeling. It was hard to dislike him. But there was some other reason for their ready acceptance of him. She worried about what that reason could be. I told you I would win them over, Richard said with a grin as he looked at her over their heads. I just never thought I would do it by laying one of them out. Chapter 23 Chickens scattered at their feet as the hunting party surrounding Kalen and Richard led them into the mud people's village. Set on a slight rise that passed for a hill in the grasslands of the wilds, the village was a collection of buildings constructed of a kind of mud brick surfaced with a tan clay plaster and topped with grass roofs that leaked as they became dry and had to be replaced constantly to keep the rain at bay. There were wood doors, but no glass in the windows of the thick walls, only cloth hanging in some to keep out the weather. 
Set in a rough circle around an open area, the buildings were one-room family homes, clustered tightly on the south side, most sharing at least one common wall, narrow walkways passing between the homes here and there, and communal buildings grouped together on the north. A variety of structures placed loosely on the east and west separated them. Some of these were nothing more than four poles with grass roofs, used as places to eat, or as work areas for making weapons and pottery, or as food preparation and cooking areas. In dry times, the whole village was shrouded in a fog of dust that clogged the eyes, nose, and tongue, but now its buildings were washed clean by the rain, and on the ground a thousand footprints were turned to puddles that reflected the drab buildings above. Women wrapped in simple dresses of brightly colored cloth sat in the work areas, grinding tava root, from which they made the flat bread that was the staple of the mud people. Sweet-smelling smoke rose from the cooking fires. Adolescent girls with short-cropped hair, smoothed down by sticky mud, sat by the women helping. Kalen felt their shy eyes on her. She knew from being here before that she was the object of great interest among the young girls, a traveler who had been to strange places and seen all sorts of things, a woman whom men feared and respected. The older women abided the distraction with understanding indulgence. Children ran from every corner of the village to see what manner of strangers Savidlin's hunting party had brought back. They crowded around the hunters, squealing with excitement, stomping their bare feet in the mud and splashing the men. Ordinarily, they would be interested in the deer and boar, but now those were ignored in favor of the strangers. The men tolerated them with good-natured smiles. Little children were never scolded. When they were older, they would be put into strict training, where they would be taught the disciplines of the mud people, of hunting, food gathering, and the ways of spirits. But for now, they were allowed to be children, with almost free reign to play. The knot of children offered up scraps of food as bribes for stories of who the strangers might be. The men laughed, declining the offerings in favor of saving the tale for the elders. Only slightly disappointed, the children continued to dance about, this being the most exciting thing that had happened in their young lives, something very much out of the ordinary, with a distinct tinge of danger. Six elders stood under the leaky protection of one of the open pole structures, waiting for Savidlin to bring the strangers to them. They wore deerskin pants and were bare-chested. Each had a coyote hide draped around his shoulders. Despite their grim faces, Kalin knew them to be more friendly than they appeared. Mud people never smiled at outsiders until greetings had been exchanged, lest their souls be stolen. Page 227. The children stayed back from the pole building, sitting in the mud to watch as the hunting party brought the outsiders to the elders. The women had halted their work at the cooking fires, as had the young men their weapons making, and all fell silent, including the children sitting in the mud. Business among the mud people was conducted in the open for all to see. Kalin stepped up to the six elders, Richard to her right, but back a pace. Savidlin to his right. The six surveyed the two outsiders. Strength to Confessor Kalin, said the eldest. Strength to Toffalar, she answered. He gave her face a gentle slap, hardly more than a pat. It was their custom to give only small slaps in the village proper. Heartier ones, like Savidlin had delivered, were reserved for chance meetings out on the plain away from the village. The gentler custom helped preserve order and teeth. Surin, Caldus, Arbrin, Bregenderin, and Hagenlet, each in turn offered strength and a small slap. Kalin returned the greetings and the gentle slaps. They turned to Richard. Savidlin stepped forward, pulling his new friend with him. He proudly displayed his swollen lip to the elders. Kalin spoke Richard's name under her breath with a rising inflection and a cautionary tone. These are important men. Please do not loosen their teeth. He gave her a quick glance out of the corner of his eye and a mischievous smile. This is the Sika, Richard with the temper, Savidlin said, proud of his charge. He leaned closer to the elders, his voice heavy with meaning. Confessor Kalen brought him to us. He is the one you spoke of, the one who brought the reins. She told me so. Kalen began to worry. She didn't know what Savidlin was talking about. The elders remained stone-faced, except Toffelar, who lifted an eyebrow. Strength to Richard with the temper, 
Toffelar said. He gave Richard a gentle slap. Strength to Toffelar, he answered in his own language, having recognized his name and immediately returned the slap. Kalin breathed out in relief that it was gentle. Savadlin beamed, showing his fat lip again. Toffelar at last smiled. After the others had given and received a greeting, they smiled too. And then they did something very odd. The six elders and Savadlin each dropped to one knee and bowed their heads to Richard. Kalin instantly tensed. What's going on? Richard asked out of the side of his mouth, alerted by her anxiety. I do not know, she answered in a low voice. Maybe it's their way of greeting the seeker. I have never seen them do this before. The men rose to their feet, all smiles. Toffelar held his hand up and motioned over their heads to the women. Please, Toffelar said to the two of them, sit with us. We are honored to have you both among us. Pulling Richard down with her, Kalin sat cross-legged on the wet wooden floor. The elders waited until they were seated before seating themselves, paying no attention to the fact that Richard kept his hand near his sword. Women came with woven trays stacked high with loaves of round, flat tava bread and other food, offering them first to Toffelar and then the other elders as they kept their eyes and smiles on Richard. They chatted softly among themselves about how big Richard with the temper was and what odd clothes he wore. They mostly ignored Kalin. Women in the Midlands tended not to like confessors. They saw them as a menace who could take their men and a threat to their lifestyle. Women were not supposed to be independent. Kalin disregarded their cool glances. She was more than used to them. Toffelar took his bread and tore it into three sections offering a third to Richard first, and then a third to Kalin. With a smile, another woman offered a bowl of roasted peppers to each. Kalin and Richard both took one, and following the elder's example, rolled them in the bread. She noticed just in time that Richard was keeping his right hand near his sword and was about to eat with his left. Richard, she warned in a harsh whisper, don't put food in your mouth with your left hand. He froze. Why? because they believe that evil spirits eat with their left hand. That's foolish, he said, an intolerant tone in his voice. Richard, please, they outnumber us. All their weapons are tipped with poison. This is a poor time for theological arguments. She could feel his gaze on her as she smiled at the elders. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw with relief that he switched the food to his right hand. Please forgive our meager offering of food, Toffelar said. We will call a banquet for tonight. No, Kalin blurted out. I mean, we do not want to impose upon your people. As you wish, Toffelar said with a shrug, a little disappointed. We are here because the mud people, among others, are in great danger. The elders all nodded and smiled. Yes, Surin spoke up. But now that you have brought Richard with the temper to us, all is well. We thank you, Confessor Kalin. We will not forget what you have done. Kalin looked around at their happy, smiling faces. She didn't know what to make of this development, and so took a bite of the flat-tasting tava bread with roasted peppers to gain time to think it over. What are they saying? Richard asked before he took a bite himself. For some reason, they are glad I brought you here. He looked over at her. Ask them why. She gave him a nod and turned to Toffelar. Honored elder, I am afraid I must admit that I am without your knowledge of Richard with the temper. He smiled knowingly. I am sorry, child. I forget you are not here when we called the Council of Seers. You see, it was dry, our crops were withering, and our people were in danger of starvation. So we called a gathering to ask the spirits for help. They told us one would come and bring the rain with him. The rains came, and here is Richard with a temper, just as they promised. And so you are happy that he is here, because he is an omen? No, Toffler said, eyes wide with excitement. We are happy that one of the spirits of our ancestors has chosen to visit us. He pointed at Richard. He is a spirit man. Kalin almost dropped her bread. She sat back in surprise. What is it? Richard asked. She stared into his eyes. They had a gathering to bring rain. The spirits told them someone would come and bring the rain. 
Richard, they think you are a spirit of their ancestors, a spirit man. He studied her face a moment. Well, I'm not. They think you are. Richard, they would do anything for a spirit. They will call a council of seers if you ask. She didn't like asking him to do this. She didn't feel at all right about deceiving the mud people, but they needed to know where the box was. Richard considered her words. No, he said quietly, while holding her gaze. Richard, we have an important task to attend to. If they think you are a spirit, and that will help us get the last box, what does it matter? It matters because it's a lie. I won't do it. Would you rather have Rahl win? She asked quietly. He gave her a cross look. First of all, I will not do it because it's wrong to deceive these people about something as important as this. Secondly, these people have a power. That is why we are here. They have proven it to me by the fact that they said one would come with the reins. That part is true. In their excitement, they have jumped to a conclusion that is not. Did they say the one who would come would be a spirit? She shook her head. People sometimes believe things simply because they want to. If it works to our advantage and theirs, what harm is there? The harm is in their power. What if they call the gathering and they see the truth that I'm not a spirit? Do you think they will be pleased that we lied to them, tricked them? Then we will be dead and Rawl wins. She leaned back and took a deep breath. The wizard chooses his seekers well, she thought. Have we aroused the temper of the spirit? Toffelar asked, a look of concern on his weathered face. He wants to know why you are angry, she said. What shall I tell him? Richard looked at the elders, then to her. I will tell them. Translate my words. Kaelin nodded her agreement. The mud people are wise and strong, he began. That is why I have come here. Your ancestors' spirits were right that I would bring the reins. They all seemed pleased when Kaelin told them his words. Everyone else in the village was stone silent as they listened. But they have not told you everything. As you know, that is the way of spirits. The elders nodded their understanding. They have left it to your wisdom to find the rest of the truth. In this way you remain strong as your children become strong because you guide them, not because you provide them their every want. It is the hope of every parent that their children will become strong and wise to think for themselves. There were nods, but not as many. What are you saying, great spirit? asked Arbrin, one of the elders in the back. Richard ran his fingers through his hair after Kalin translated. I am saying that, yes, I brought the reins, but there is more. Perhaps the spirit saw a greater danger for your people, and that is the more important reason I have come. There is a very dangerous man who would rule your people, make you his slaves. His name is Dark and Rahl. There were snickers among the elders. Then he sends fools to be our masters, Toffelar said. Richard regarded them angrily. The laughter died out. It is his way to lull you into overconfidence. Do not be fooled. He has used his power and his magic to conquer peoples of greater numbers than you. When he chooses, he will crush you. The rains came because he sends clouds to follow me to know where I am, that he might try to kill me at a time of his choosing. I am not a spirit. I am the seeker, just a man. I want to stop dark and raw, so that your people and others may live their own lives as they wish. Toffelar's eyes narrowed. If what you say is true, then the one called Raal sent the rains and has saved our people. That is what his missionary tried to teach us, that Raal would save us. No, Raal sent the clouds to follow me, not to save you. I chose to come here, just as your spirit ancestors said I would. They said the rains would come, and a man would come when they did. They did not say I would be a spirit. There was great disappointment in the expressions of the elders as Kaelin interpreted. She hoped it wouldn't turn to anger. Then maybe the message of the spirits was a warning about the man that would come, Surin said. And maybe it was a warning about Rawl, Richard answered right back. I am offering you the truth. You must use your wisdom to see it, or your people are lost. I offer you a chance to help save yourselves. The elders considered in silence. Your words seem to flow true, Richard, with the temper. But it is yet to be decided, Toffelar said at last. What is it you want from us? 
The elders sat quietly, the joy gone from their faces. The rest of the village waited in quiet fear. Richard regarded the face of each elder in turn, then spoke quietly. Dark and Rawl looks for a magic that will give him the power to rule everyone, including the mud people. I look for this magic also, so that I might deny him the power. I would like you to call a council of seers to tell me where I might find this magic before it is too late, before Rawl finds it first. Toffelar's face hardened. We do not call gatherings for outsiders. Kalen could tell that Richard was getting angry and straining to control himself. She didn't move her head, but her eyes swept around, gauging where everyone was, especially the men with weapons, in case they had to fight their way out. She didn't judge their chances of escape to be very good. Suddenly, she wished she had never brought him here. Richard's eyes were full of fire as he looked around at the people of the village and then back to the elders. In return for bringing you the rain, I ask of you only that you do not decide right now. Consider what manner of man you find me to be. He was keeping his voice calm, but there was no mistaking the import of his words. Think it over carefully. Many lives depend upon your decision. Mine, Kalen's, yours. As Kalen translated, she was suddenly suffused with the cold feeling that Richard was not talking to the elders. He was speaking to someone else. She suddenly felt the eyes of that other on her. Her own gaze swept the crowd. All eyes were on the two of them. She didn't know whose gaze she still felt. Fair, Toffelar proclaimed at last. You both are free to be among our people as honored guests while we consider. Please enjoy all we have. Share our food and our homes. The elders departed through the light rain toward the communal buildings. The crowd went back to their business, shooing the children as they went. Savidlin was the last to leave. He smiled and offered his help in anything they might need. She thanked him as he stepped off into the rain. Kalen and Richard sat alone on the wet wooden floor, dodging the drips of rainwater leaking through the roof. The woven trays of tava bread and the bowl of roasted peppers remained behind. She leaned over and took one of each, wrapping the bread around the pepper. She handed it to Richard and made herself another. You angry with me? he asked. No, she admitted with a smile. I am proud of you. A little boy grin spread on his face. He began eating with his right hand and made short work of it. After he swallowed the last bite, he spoke again. Look over my right shoulder. There is a man leaning against the wall, long gray hair, arms folded across his chest. Tell me if you know who he is. Kalen took a bite of the bread and pepper, chewing as she glanced over his shoulder. He is the bird man. I don't know anything about him except that he can call birds to himself. Richard took another piece of bread, rolled it up, and took a bite. I think it's time we went and had a talk with him. Why? Richard looked up at her from under his eyebrows. Because he's the one who is in charge around here. Kalen frowned. The elders are in charge. Richard smiled with one side of his mouth. My brother always says that real power is not brokered in public. He watched her intently with his gray eyes. The elders are for show. They are respected and so are put on display for others to see, like the skulls on the poles, only they still have the skin on them. They have authority because they are esteemed, but they are not in charge. With a quick flick of his eyes, Richard indicated the bird man leaning against the wall behind him. He is. Then why has he not made himself known? Because, he said grinning, he wants to know how smart we are. Richard stood and held his hand out to her. She stuffed the rest of the bread in her mouth, brushed her hands on her pants, and took his hand. As he hoisted her up, she thought about how much she liked the way he always offered her his hand. He was the first person who had ever done that. It was just one part of why it felt so easy being with him. They walked across the mud through the cold rain toward the bird man. He still leaned against the wall, his sharp brown eyes watching them come. Long hair, mostly silver gray, lay on his shoulders, flowing partway down the deerskin tunic that matched his pants. His clothes had no decoration, but a bone carving hung on a leather thong around his neck. Not old, but not young, and still handsome, he was about as tall as she. The skin of his weathered face was as tough-looking as the deerskin clothes he wore. 
They stopped in front of him. He continued to lean his shoulders against the wall and his right knee stuck out as his foot propped against the plastered brick. His arms lay folded across his chest as he studied their faces. Richard folded his arms across his own chest. I would like to talk to you. If you are not afraid, I might be a spirit. The birdman's eyes went to hers as she translated, then back to Richard's. I have seen spirits before, he said in a quiet voice. They do not carry swords. Kalin translated. Richard laughed. She liked his easy laugh. I also have seen spirits, and you are right. They do not carry swords. A small smile curled the corners of the birdman's mouth. He unfolded his arms and stood up straight. Strength to the seeker. He gave Richard a gentle slap. Strength to the birdman, he said, returning the easy slap. The birdman took the bone carving that hung on the leather thong at his neck and put it to his lips. Kalin realized it was a whistle. His cheeks puffed out as he blew, but there was no sound. Letting the whistle drop back, he held his arm out while he continued to hold Richard's eyes. After a moment, a hawk wheeled out of the gray sky and alighted on his outstretched arm. It fluffed its feathers, then let them settle as its black eyes blinked and its head swiveled about in short, jerky movements. Come, the birdman said. We will talk. He led them among the large communal buildings to a smaller one at the back, set away from the others. Kayla knew the building with no windows, although she had never seen it. It was the spirit house, where the gatherings were held. The hawk stayed on his arm as the birdman pulled the door open and motioned them inside. A small fire was burning in a pit at the back end, offering a little light to the otherwise dark room. A hole in the roof above the fire let the smoke out, although it did a poor job of it, and left the place with a sharp, smoky smell. Pottery bowls left from past meals lay about the floor, and a plank shelf along one wall held a good two dozen ancestral skulls. Otherwise, the room was empty. The birdman found a place near the center of the room where the rain wasn't dripping and sat down on the dirt floor. Kalin and Richard sat side by side, facing him as the hawk watched their movements. The birdman looked at Kalin's eyes. She could tell he was used to having people be afraid when he looked at them, even if it wasn't warranted. She could tell because she was used to the same thing. This time he found no fear. Mother confessor, you have not yet chosen a mate. He gently stroked the hawk's head while he watched her. Kalin decided she didn't like his tone. He was testing. No. Are you offering yourself? He smiled slightly. No. I apologize. I did not mean to offend you. Why are you not with a wizard? All the wizards save two are dead. Of those two, one sold his services to a queen. The other was struck down by an underworld beast and lies in a sleep. There are none left to protect me. All the other confessors have been killed. We are in dark times. His eyes looked genuinely sympathetic, but his tone still was not. It is dangerous for a confessor to be alone. Yes, and it is also dangerous for a man to be alone with a confessor who is in great want of something. From where I sit, it would seem that you are in greater danger than I. Perhaps, he said, stroking the hawk, his slight smile returning. Perhaps. This one is a true seeker, one named by a wizard? Yes. The birdman nodded. It has been many years since I have seen a true seeker. A seeker who was not a real seeker came here one time. He killed some of my people when we would not give him what he wanted. I am sorry for them, she said. He shook his head slowly. Do not be. They died quickly. Be sorry for the seeker. He did not. The hawk blinked as it looked at her. I have never seen a pretend seeker, but I have seen this one in the rage. Believe me, you and your people do not want to ever give this one cause to draw his sword in anger. He knows how to use the magic. I have seen him strike down evil spirits. He studied her eyes for a moment seeming to judge the truth of what she said. Thank you for the warning. I will remember your words. Richard spoke up at last. Are you two about done threatening each other? Kalin looked at him in surprise. I thought you couldn't understand their language. Can't, 
but I can understand eyes. If looks caused sparks, this place would be ablaze. Kalin turned back to the birdman. The seeker wishes to know if we are finished threatening each other. He glanced at Richard and then back to her. He is an impatient man, is he not? She nodded. I have told him so myself. He denies it. It must be a burden traveling with him. Kalin broke into a smile. Not at all. The birdman returned her smile and then addressed his gaze to Richard. If we choose not to help you, how many of us will you kill? Kalin interpreted the words as they spoke. None. The birdman studied the hawk as he asked, And if we choose not to help Dark and Ral, how many of us will he kill? Sooner or later, a great many. He took his hand away from the hawk and looked at Richard with his sharp eyes. It would seem you argue for us to help Dark and Ral. A smile spread across Richard's face. If you choose not to help me and remain neutral, foolish as that would be, it is your right, and I will harm none of your people. But Rahl will. I will press on and fight against him with my last breath if need be. His face took on a dangerous expression. He leaned forward. If, on the other hand, you choose to help darken Rahl, and I defeat him, I will come back, and... He pulled his finger across his throat in a quick gesture that needed no translation. The birdman sat stone-faced, no quick retort at hand. We wish only to be left alone, he said at last. Richard shrugged, looking down at the ground. I can understand that. I, too, wished only to be left alone. His eyes came up. Dark and Rahl killed my father and sends evil spirits that haunt me in my father's guise. He sends men to try to kill Kalin. He brings down the boundary to invade my homeland. His minions have struck down my two oldest friends. They lie in a deep sleep near death, but at least they will live, unless he is successful the next time. Kalin has told me of many he has killed. Children, stories that would make your heart sick. He nodded his voice soft, hardly more than a whisper. Yes, my friend, I too wished only to be left alone. On the first day of winter, if Darken Rahl gains the magic he seeks, he will have a power no one can stand against. Then it will be too late. His hand went to his sword. Kalin's eyes widened. If he were here in my place, he would pull this sword and have your help or have your head. He took his hand away. That, my friend, is why I cannot harm you if you choose not to help me. The birdman sat quiet and still for a while. I can see now that I do not want Dark and Rahl for an enemy. Or you. He got up and went to the door, casting the hawk into the sky. The birdman sat once more, sighing heavily with the weight of his thoughts. Your words seem to flow true, but I cannot know for sure yet. It would also seem that although you want us to help you, you also wish to help us. I believe you are sincere in this. It is a wise man who seeks help by helping, and not by threats or tricks. If I wanted to get your help by tricks, I would have let you believe me to be a spirit. The corners of the birdman's mouth turned up in a small smile. If we had held a gathering, we would have discovered you were not. A wise man would suspect that too. So which reason is it that made you tell the truth? You did not want to trick us? Or you were afraid to? Richard smiled back. In truth, both. The birdman nodded. Thank you for the truth. Richard sat quietly, took a deep breath, and let it out slowly. So, Birdman, I have told you my tale. You must judge it true or not. Time works against me. Will you help? It is not that simple. My people look to me for direction. If you asked for food, I could say, give him food, and they would do so. But you have asked for a gathering. That is different. The Council of Seers are the six elders you spoke to, plus myself. They are old men, firm in the ways of their past. An outsider has never been given a gathering before, never been permitted to disturb the peace of our ancestors' spirits. Soon, these six will join the ancestors' spirits, and they do not want to think they will be called from the spirit world for an outsider's needs. If they break the tradition... They will be forever burdened with the results. I cannot order them to do this. 
It is not only an outsider's needs, Kalin said, telling them both her words. Helping us also helps the mud people. Maybe in the end, the birdman said, but not in the beginning. What if I were one of the mud people, Richard asked, his eyes narrowing. Then they would call the gathering for you and not violate the tradition. Could you make me one of the mud people? The birdman's silver-gray hair glistened in the firelight as he considered. If you were to first do something that helped our people, something that benefited them with no advantage to you, proved you were a man of good intentions toward us, doing so without promise of aid for your help, and the elders wished it, I could. And once you named me as one of the mud people, I could ask for a gathering and they would call it? If you were one of us, they would know you had our interests in your heart. They would call a council of seers to help you. And if they called the council, would they be able to tell me where the object I seek is located? I cannot answer that. Sometimes the spirits will not answer our questions. Sometimes they do not know the answers to our questions. There is no guarantee that we could help you, even if we held a gathering. All I can promise is that we would try our best. Richard looked down at the ground, thinking. With his finger, he pushed some dirt into one of the puddles where the rain dripped. Kalen, he asked quietly, do you know of anyone else who would have the power to tell us where to look for the box? Kalen had been giving this consideration all day. I do. But of all the ones I know of, I do not know of any who would be any more eager to help us than the mud people are. Some would kill us just for asking. Well, of the ones who wouldn't kill us just for asking, how far away are they? Three weeks at least, north, through very dangerous country controlled by Rahl. Three weeks, Richard said out loud with a heavy tone of disappointment. But Richard, the birdman is able to promise us precious little. If you could find a way to help them... If it pleases the elders, if they ask the birdman to name you one of the mud people, if the council of seers can get an answer, if the spirits even know the answer, if, 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 many opportunities for a wrong step. Was it not you who told me I would have to win them over? He asked with a smile. It was. So what do you think? Do you think we should stay and try to convince them to help, or we should go to find the answers elsewhere? She shook her head slowly. I think you are the seeker, and you will have to decide. He smiled again. You are my friend. I could use your advice. She hooked some hair behind her ear. I don't know what advice to give, Richard, and my life, too, depends upon you making the right choice. But as your friend, I have faith that you will decide wisely. Will you hate me, he grinned, if I make the wrong choice? She looked into his gray eyes, eyes that could see into her, eyes that made her weak with longing. Even if you choose wrong, and it costs me my life, she whispered swallowing back the lump in her throat. I could never hate you. He looked away from her, back down at the dirt a while, then once again up to the birdman. Do your people like having roofs that leak? The birdman raised an eyebrow. Would you like it if water dripped on your face when you were asleep? Smiling, Richard shook his head. Then why don't you make roofs that don't leak? The birdman shrugged. Because it cannot be done. We have no materials at hand to use. Clay bricks are too heavy and would fall down. Wood is too scarce. It must be carried long distances. Grass is all we have, and it leaks. Richard took one of the pottery bowls and turned it upside down under one of the drips. You have clay from which you make pottery. Our ovens are small. We could not make a pot that big. And besides, it would crack, and then it too would leak. It cannot be done. It is a mistake to say something cannot be done simply because you don't know how to do it. I would not be here otherwise. He said this gently, without malice. Your people are strong and wise. I would be honored if the birdman would allow me to teach his people how to make roofs that do not leak, and also let the smoke out at the same time. The birdman considered this without showing any emotion. If you could do this, it would be a great benefit to my people, and they would give you many thanks but I can make no promises beyond that. Richard shrugged. None asked for. The answer may still be no. You must accept that, if that is the answer, and bring no harm to my people. I will do my best for your people and hope only that they judge me fairly. Then you are free to try, but I cannot see how you will make a roof of clay that will not crack and leak. 
I will make a roof for your spirit house that will have a thousand cracks but will not leak. Then I will teach you to make more for yourselves. The birdman smiled and gave a nod. Chapter 24 I hate my mother. The master, sitting cross-legged on the grass, looked down at the bitter expression on the boy's face and waited a moment before he answered in a quiet voice. That is a very strong thing to say, Carl. I would not want you to say something you would come to regret when you had thought it over. I've thought it over plenty, Carl snapped. We've talked about it a long time. I know now how they've twisted me around, deceived me, how selfish they are. He squinted his eyes. How they are enemies of the people. Rahl glanced up at the windows, at the last tinge of fading sunlight, turning the wisps of clouds a beautiful deep reddish purple, frosted with tips of gold. Tonight. Tonight, at long last, would be the night he returned to the underworld. For most of long days and nights, he had kept the boy awake with the special gruel, allowing him to sleep for only brief spells, kept him awake to hammer away at him until his mind was empty and could be molded. He had talked to the boy endlessly, convincing him how others had used him, abused him, and lied to him. Sometimes he had left the boy to think over what he had been told, and used the excuse to visit his father's tomb and read the sacred inscriptions again, or to snatch some rest. And then last night he had taken that girl to his bed to get some relaxation, a small momentary diversion, an interlude of gentleness to feel another's soft flesh against his to relieve his pent-up excitement. She should have been honored, especially after he had been so tender with her, so charming. She had been anxious enough to be with him. But what did she do? She laughed. When she saw the scars, she laughed. As he thought of it now, Rahl had to strain to control his rage, strain to show the boy a smile, strain to hide his impatience to get on with it. He thought of what he had done to the girl, the exhilaration of his violence unleashed, her ripping screams. The smile came more easily to his lips. She would laugh at him no more. What's the big grin for? Carl asked. Rahl looked down at the boy's big brown eyes. I was just thinking about how proud I am of you. His smile widened as he remembered the way her hot, sticky blood pumped and spurted as she screamed. Where was her haughty laughter then? Me? Carl asked, smiling shyly. Raoul's blonde head nodded. Yes, Carl, you. Not many young men of your age would be intelligent enough to see the world as it really is to see beyond their own lives to the wider dangers and wonders all about, to see how hard I work to bring safety and peace to the people. He shook his head sadly. Sometimes it hurts my heart to see the very ones for whom I struggle so hard turn their backs to me, reject my tireless efforts, or worse yet, join with the enemies of the people. I have not wanted to burden you with worry for me, but right now as I speak with you, there are evil people who plot to conquer us, to crush us. They have brought down the boundary that protected Dahara, and now the second boundary, too. I fear they plot an invasion. I have tried to warn the people of the danger from Westland to get them to do something to protect themselves, but they are poor and simple people. They look to me for protection. Carl's eyes widened. Father Rahl, are you in danger? Rahl brushed the matter away with a wave of his hand. It's not me I fear for, it's the people. If I were to die, who would protect them? Die? Carl's eyes filled with tears. Oh, Father Rahl, we need you. Please don't let them get you. Please let me fight at your side. I want to help protect you. I couldn't stand the thought of you getting hurt. Rahl's breathing quickened, his heart raced. The time was near. It would not be long now. He smiled warmly at Carl as he remembered the girl's hoarse screams. I could not stand the thought of you being in danger for me. Carl, I have come to know you these last days. You are more to me than simply a young man who has chosen to help me with this ceremony. You have become my friend. I have shared my deepest concerns with you, my hopes, my dreams. I don't do that with many. It's enough to know you care. Tears in his eyes, 
Carl looked up at the master. Father Rall, he whispered, I'd do anything for you. Please let me stay. After the ceremony, let me stay and be with you. I'll do anything you need. I promise, if I could just stay with you. Carl, that's so like you, so kind. But you have a life, parents, friends. And Tinker, don't forget your dog. Soon you will be wanting to go back to all that. Carl slowly shook his head while his eyes stayed on Rawl. No, I won't. I only want to be with you. Father Rawl, I love you. I'd do anything for you. Rawl considered the boy's words, a serious look on his face. It would be dangerous for you to stay with me. Rawl could feel his heart pounding. I don't care. I want to serve you. I don't care if I might get killed. I only want to help you. I don't want to do anything else but help you in your fight with those enemies. Father Rawl, if I got killed helping you, it would be worth it. Please let me stay. I'll do whatever you ask. Forever. To help control his rapid breathing, Rawl took a deep breath and let it out slowly. His face was grave. Are you sure of what you are saying, Carl? Are you sure you really mean it? I mean, are you really sure you would give your life for me? I swear, I'd die to help you. My life is yours if you'll have it. Rahl leaned back a little, put his hands on his knees and nodded slowly. His blue eyes riveted on the boy. Yes, Carl. I will have it. Carl didn't smile, but shook slightly with the excitement of acceptance. His face set in determination. When can we do the ceremony? I want to help you and the people. Soon, Rawl said, his eyes getting wide and his speech slow. Tonight, after I have fed you. Are you ready to begin? Yes. Rawl rose, feeling the surge of blood through his veins. He strained to control the flush of arousal. It was dark outside. The torches gave off a flickering light that danced in his blue eyes, gleamed on his long blonde hair, and made his white robe seem to glow. Before going to the forge room, he placed the feeding horn near Carl's mouth. Inside the dark room, his guards waited, their massive arms folded across their chests. Sweat rolling from their skin left little trails in the light covering of soot. A crucible sat in the fire of the forge, an acrid smell rising from the dross. Eyes wide, Raoul addressed his guards. Is Damon back? For several days, master. Tell him to come and wait, Raoul said, unable to manage more than a whisper. And then I would like you two to leave me alone for now. They bowed and left through the back door. Raoul swept his hand over the crucible and the smell changed to an appetizing aroma. His eyes closed as he offered silent prayers to the spirit of his father. His breathing was a shallow pant. In the fervor of his emotions, he was unable to control it. He licked his shaking fingertips and rubbed them on his lips. Affixing wooden handles to the crucible so as to lift it without burning himself, he used the magic to make its weight easy to maneuver and went back through the door with it. The torches lit the area around the boy, the white sand with the symbols traced in it, the ring of grass, the altar set on the wedge of white stone. Torchlight reflected off the polished stone block that held the iron bowl with the shinga on its lid. Raoul's blue eyes took it all in as he approached the boy. He stopped in front of him by the mouth of the feeding horn. There was a glaze in his eyes as he looked down to Carl's upturned face. Are you sure about this, Carl? He asked hoarsely. Can I trust you with my life? I swear my loyalty to you, Father Rahl. Forever. Rahl's eyes closed as he drew a sharp breath. Sweat beaded on his face, stuck his robes to his skin. He could feel waves of heat rolling off the crucible. He added the heat of his magic to the vessel to keep its contents boiling. Softly, he began chanting the sacred incantations in the ancient language. Charms and spells whispered their haunting sounds in the air. Rawl's back arched as he felt power surging through his body, taking him with hot promise. He shook as he chanted, offering up his words to the spirit of the boy. 
His eyes opened part way, the visage of wanton passion burning in them. His breathing was ragged. His hands trembled slightly. He gazed down at the boy. Carl, he said in a husky whisper, I love you. I love you, Father Rahl. Rahl's eyes slid closed. Put your mouth over the horn, my boy, and hold tight. While Carl did as he was told, Rahl chanted the last charm, his heart pounding. The torches hissed and spit while they burned, the sound intertwining with that of the spell. And then he poured the contents of the crucible into the horn. Carl's eyes snapped wide, and he both inhaled and swallowed involuntarily when the molten lead hit him, searing into his body. Dark and Rahl shuddered with excitement. He let the empty crucible slip from his hands to the ground. The master went on to the next set of incantations, the sending of the boy's spirit to the underworld. He said the words, every word in the proper order, opening the way to the underworld, opening the void, opening the dark emptiness. As his hands extended upward, dark forms swirled around him. Howls filled the night air with the terror of their calls. Dark and Rahl went to the cold stone altar, knelt in front of it, stretched his arm across it, put his face to it. He spoke the words in the ancient language that would link the boy's spirit to him. For a short while, he cast the needed spells. When finished, he stood, fists at his side, his face flushed. Demon Na stepped forward out of the shadows. Rahl's vision focused on his friend. Demon, he whispered, his voice coarse. Master Rahl, he answered in greeting, bowing his head. Rahl stepped to Demon, his face drawn and sweat-streaked. Take his body from the ground and put it on the altar. Use the bucket of water to wash him clean. He glanced down at the short sword Demon wore. Crack his skull for me, no more, and then you may stand back and wait. He passed his hands over Demon's head. The air about shuddered. This spell will protect you. Wait for me, then, until I return just before dawn. I will need you. He looked away, lost in his thoughts. Demon did as asked, going about the grim task, while Rahl continued to chant the strange words, rocking back and forth, his eyes closed, as if in a trance. Demon wiped his sword clean on his muscular forearm and returned it to its scabbard. He took one last look at Rahl, who was still lost in the trance. I hate this part he muttered to himself. He turned and went back into the shadows of the trees, leaving the master to his work. Dark and Rahl went to stand behind the altar, breathing in deeply. Suddenly, he cast his hand down at the fire pit, and flames leapt up with a roar. He held out both hands, fingers contorted, and the iron bowl lifted and floated over, setting itself down on the fire. Rahl pulled his curved knife from its sheath and laid it on the boy's wet belly. He slipped his robes from his shoulders and let them drop to the ground, kicking them back out of the way. Sweat covered his lean form, ran down his neck in rivulets. His skin was smooth and taut over his well-proportioned muscles, except on his upper left thigh, across part of his hip and abdomen, and the left side of his erect sex. That was where the scar was, where the flames sent by the old wizard had tasted him. The flames of the wizard's fire that had consumed his father as he stood at his right hand. Flames that had licked him also, giving him the pain of the wizard's fire. It had been a fire unlike any other, burning, sticking, searing, alive with purpose, as he had screamed until he had lost his voice. Dark and Rahl licked his fingers and, reaching down, ran them wetly over the bumpy scars. How he had so badly wanted to do that when he had been burned. How he had so badly wanted to do it to stop the terror of the unrelenting pain and burning. But the healers wouldn't let him. They said he mustn't touch the burn, and so they bound him by his wrists to keep him from reaching down. He had licked his fingers and instead rubbed them on his lips as he shook to try to stop his crying, and on his eyes to try to wipe away the vision of having seen his father burned alive. For months he had cried and panted and begged to touch and soothe the burns, but they would not let him. How he hated the wizard. How he wanted to kill him. How he wanted to push his hand into the wizard's living body while he looked into his eyes and pull his heart out. 
Dark and Rawl took his fingers away from the scar and, picking up the knife, put the thoughts of that time out of his mind. He was a man now. He was the master. He put his mind back to the matter at hand. He wove the proper spell and then plunged the knife into the boy's chest. With care, he removed the heart and put it into the iron bowl of boiling water. Next, he removed the brain and added it to the bowl. Last, he took the testicles and added them too. Then finally, he put the knife down, blood mixed with the sweat that covered him. It dripped from his elbows. He laid his arms across the body and offered prayers to the spirits. His face lifted to the dark windows above as he closed his eyes and continued the incantations, rolling them out without having to think. For an hour, he went on with the words of the ceremony, smearing the blood on his chest at the proper time. When he had finished with the runes from his father's tomb, he went to the sorcerer's sand where the boy had been buried for the time of his testing. With his arms, he smoothed the sand. It stuck to the blood in a white crust. Squatting, he carefully began drawing the symbols, radiating from the center axis, branching in intricate patterns learned in years of study. He concentrated as he worked into the night, his straight blonde hair hanging down, his brow wrinkled with intensity as he added each element, leaving out no line or stroke or curve, for that would be fatal. At last finished, he went to the sacred bowl and found the water almost boiled away as it should be. With magic, he floated the bowl back to the polished stone block and let it cool a little before he took a stone pestle and began grinding. He mashed, sweat running from his face, until he had worked the heart, brain, and testicles into a paste, to which he added magic powders from pockets in his discarded robes. Standing in front of the altar, he held up the bowl with the mixture while he cast the calling spells. He lowered the bowl when finished and looked around at the Garden of Life. He always liked to look upon beautiful things before he went to the underworld. With his fingers, he ate from the bowl. He hated the taste of meat and never ate anything but plants. Now, though, there was no choice. The way was the way. If he wanted to go to the underworld, he had to eat the flesh. He ignored the taste and ate it all, trying to think of it as vegetable paste. Licking his fingers clean, he set the bowl down and went to sit cross-legged on the grass in front of the white sand. His blonde hair was matted in places with dried blood. He placed his hands palm up on his knees, closed his eyes, and took deep breaths, preparing himself for meeting the spirit of the boy. At last ready, all preparation done, all charms spoken, all spells cast, the master raised his head and opened his eyes. Come to me, Carl, he whispered in the secret ancient language. There was a moment of dead silence, and then a wailing roar. The ground shook. From the center of the sand, the center of the enchantment, the boy's spirit rose in the form of the Shinga, the underworld beast. The Shinga came, transparent at first, like smoke rising from the ground, turning as if unscrewing itself from the white sand, lured by the drawing. Its head reared as it struggled to pull itself through the drawing, snorted steam from its flared nostrils. Raoul calmly watched as the fearsome beast rose, becoming solid as it came, ripping the ground and pulling the sand up with it, its powerful hind legs pulling through at last as it reared with a wail. A hole opened, black as pitch. Sand around the edges fell away into the bottomless darkness. The Shinga floated above it. Piercing brown eyes looked down at Raoul. Thank you for coming, Carl. The beast bent forward, nuzzling its muzzle against the master's bare chest. Raoul came to his feet and stroked the Shinga's head as it bucked, calming its impatience to be off. When at last it quieted, Raoul climbed onto its back and held its neck tight. With a flash of light, the Shinga, dark and Raoul astride its back, dissolved back into the black void, corkscrewing itself down as it went. The ground shuddered, and the hole closed with a grating sound. The garden of life was left in the sudden silence of the night. From the shadows of the trees, Demin Nas stepped forward, forehead beaded with sweat. Safe journey, my friend, he whispered. Safe journey. Chapter 25 
The rain held off for the time being, but the sky remained thickly overcast, as it had been for almost as long as he could remember. Sitting alone on a small bench against the wall of another building, Kaylin smiled to herself as she watched Richard construct the roof of the spirit house. Sweat ran off his bare back over the swell of his muscles, over the scars where the gar's claws had raked his back. Richard was working with Savadlin and some other men, teaching them. He had told her he didn't need her to translate, that working with one's hands was universal. And if they had to partly figure it out themselves, they would understand it better and have more pride in what they had done. Savadlin kept jabbering questions Richard didn't understand. Richard just smiled and explained things in words the others couldn't understand, using his hands in a sign language he invented as needed. Sometimes the others thought it hilarious, and all would end up laughing. They had accomplished a lot for men who didn't understand each other. At first, Richard hadn't told her what he was doing. He just smiled and said she would have to wait and see. First, he took blocks of clay about one by two feet and made wave-like forms. Half the block's face was a concave trough, like a gutter, the other half a long, rounded hump. He hollowed them out and asked the women who worked the pottery to fire them. Next, he attached two uniform strips of wood to a flat board, one to each side, and put a lump of soft clay into the center. Using a rolling pin, he flattened the clay, the two strips of wood acting as a thickness gauge. Slicing off the excess at the top and bottom of the board, he ended up with slabs of clay of a uniform thickness and size, which he draped and smoothed over the forms the women had fired for him. He used a stick to poke a hole in the two upper corners. The women followed him around, inspecting his work closely, so he enlisted their help. Soon he had a whole crew of smiling, chatting women making the slabs and forming them, showing him how to do it better. When the slabs were dry, they could be pulled from the forms. While these were being fired, the women, by then buzzing with curiosity, made more. When they asked how many they should make, he said to just keep making them. Richard left them to their new work and went to the spirit house and began making a fireplace out of the mud bricks that were used for the buildings. Savadlin followed him around, trying to learn everything. You're making clay roofing tiles, aren't you? Kalin had asked him. Yes, he had said with a smile. Richard, I have seen thatched roofs that do not leak. So have I. Then why not simply make their grass roofs over properly so they don't leak? Do you know how to thatch roofs? No, neither do I. But I do know how to make tile roofs, so that's what I have to do. While he was building the fireplace and showing Savadlin how to do it, he had other men strip the grass off the roof, leaving a skeleton of poles that ran the length of the building, poles that had been used to tie down each course of grass. Now they would be used to secure the clay tiles. The tiles spanned from one row of poles to the next, the bottom edge laid on the first pole, the top edge laid on the second, with the holes in the tiles used to lash them tight to the poles. The second course of tiles was laid so its bottom edge overlapped the top of the first, covering the holes that tied the tiles down, and owing to their wave-like form, each interlocked with the one before. Because the clay tiles were heavier than the grass, Richard had first reinforced the poles from underneath with supports running up the pitch of the roof, with cross members bracing them. It seemed as if half the village was engaged in the construction. The birdman came by from time to time to watch the work, pleased with what he saw. Sometimes he sat with Kalen saying nothing, sometimes he talked with her, but mostly he just watched. Occasionally he slipped in a question about Richard's character. Most of the time while Richard was working, Kalen was alone. The women weren't interested in her offers of help. The men kept their distance, watching her out of the corners of their eyes, and the young girls were too shy to actually bring themselves to talk to her. Sometimes she found them standing, staring at her. When she would ask their names, they would only give their shy smiles and run away. The little children wanted to approach, but their mothers kept them well clear. She wasn't allowed to help with the cooking or the making of the tiles. Her approaches were politely turned down with the excuse that she was an honored guest. She knew better. She was a confessor. They were afraid of her. Kaylin was used to the attitude, the looks, the whispers. It no longer bothered her, as it had when she was younger. She remembered her mother smiling at her, telling her it was just the way people were, and it could not be changed. 
that she must not let it bring her to bitterness and that she would come to be above it some day. She had thought she was beyond caring, that it didn't matter to her, that she had accepted who she was, the way life was, that she could have none of what other people had and that it was all right. That was before she met Richard, before he became her friend, accepted her, talked to her, treated her like a normal person, cared about her. But then Richard didn't know what she was. Savadlin, at least, had been friendly to her. He had taken her and Richard into his small home with him, his wife, Wesselan, and their young boy, Sidden, and had given them a place to sleep on the floor. Even if it was because Savadlin had insisted, Wesselan had accepted Kalin into her home with gracious hospitality and did not show coldness when she had the chance, unseen by her husband, to do so. At night, after it was too dark to work, Sidden would sit wide-eyed on the floor with Kalin as she told him stories of kings and castles, of far-off lands, and of fierce beasts. He would crawl into her lap and beg for more stories and give her hugs. It brought tears to her eyes now to think of how Wesselon let him do that without pulling him away, how she had the kindness not to show her fear. When Sidden went to sleep, she and Richard would tell Savadlin and Wesselon some of the stories of their journey from Westland. Savadlin was one who respected success in struggle and listened with eyes almost as wide as his son's had been. The birdman had seemed pleased with the new roof. Shaking his head slowly, he had smiled to himself when he had seen enough to figure out how it would work. But the other six elders were less impressed. To them, a little rain dripping in once in a while seemed hardly enough to become concerned about. It had done so their whole life and they were resentful of an outsider coming in and showing them how stupid they had been. Someday, when one of the elders died, Savadlin would become one of the six. Kalin wished he were one now, for they could use such a strong ally among the elders. Kalin worried about what would happen when the roof was finished, about what would happen if the elders refused to ask to have Richard named one of the mud people. Richard had not given her his promise that he wouldn't hurt them, even though he was not the kind of person to do something like that, he was the seeker. More was at stake than the lives of a few of these people, much more. The seeker had to take that into account. She had to take that into account. Kalin didn't know if killing the last man of the quad had changed him, made him harder. Learning to kill made you weigh matters differently, made it easier to kill again. That was something she knew all too well. Kalin wished so much he had not come to her aid when he had, wished he had not killed that man. She didn't have the heart to tell him it was unnecessary. She could have handled it herself. After all, one man alone was hardly a mortal danger to her. That was why Rahl always sent four men after confessors, one to be touched by her power, the other three to kill him and the confessor. Sometimes only one was left, but that was enough after a confessor had spent her power. But one alone? He had almost no chance. Even if he was big, she was faster. When he swung his sword, she would have simply jumped out of the way. Before he could have brought it up again, she would have touched him, and he would have been hers. That would have been the end of him. Kayla knew there was no way she could ever tell Richard that there had been no need for him to kill. What made it doubly bad was that he had killed for her, had thought he was saving her. Kayla knew another quad was probably on its way. They were relentless. The man Richard had killed knew he was going to die, knew he didn't stand a chance alone against a confessor, but he came anyway. They would not stop, did not know the meaning of it, never thought of anything but their objective. And they enjoyed what they did to confessors. Even though she tried not to, she couldn't help remembering Denis. Whenever she thought of the quads, she couldn't help remembering what they had done to Denis. Before Kaylin had become a woman, her mother had been stricken with a terrible sickness, one no healer was able to turn back. She had died all too quickly of the awful wasting disease. Confessors were a close sisterhood. When trouble struck one, it struck all. Denis's mother took in Kaylin and comforted her. The two girls, best friends, had been thrilled that they were to be sisters, as they called themselves from then on, and it helped ease the pain of losing her mother. Denis was a frail girl, as frail as her mother. She did not have the strength of power that Kaylin did, and over time Kaylin became her protector, guardian, shielding her from situations that required more force than she could bring from within. After its use, Kaylin could recover the strength of her power in an hour or two, 
but for Denis, it sometimes took several days. On one fateful day, Kalin had been away for a short time, taking a confession from a murderer who was to be hanged, a mission that was to have been Denis. Kalin had gone in her sister's place because she wanted to spare Denis the torment of the task. Denis hated taking confessions, hated seeing the look in their eyes. Sometimes she would cry for days after. She never asked Kaylin to go in her stead. She wouldn't. But the look of relief on her face when Kaylin told her she would do it was words enough. Kaylin, too, disliked taking confessions. But she was stronger, wiser, more reflective. She understood and accepted that being a confessor was her power. It was who she was, and so it didn't hurt her the way it did Denis. Kaylin had always been able to place her head before her heart, and she would have done any dirty job in Denis's place. On the trail home, Kaylin heard soft whimpers from the brush at the side of the road, moans of mortal pain. To her horror, she discovered Denis thrown there, discarded. I was coming to meet you. I wanted to walk back with you, Denis had said, as Kaylin cradled the girl's head in her lap. A quad caught me. I'm sorry. I got one of them, Kaylin. I touched him. I got one of them. You would have been proud of me. In shock, Kaylin held Denis's head, comforted her, telling her it would be all right. Please, Kaylin, pull my dress down for me. Her voice sounded as if it were coming from a faraway place, wet and weak. My arms don't work. Past panic, Kaylin saw why. Denis's arms had been brutally broken. They lay useless at her sides, bent in places where they shouldn't be bent. Blood trickled from one ear. Kaylin pulled what was left of the blood-soaked dress over her sister, covering her as best she could. Her head spun with the horror of what the men had done. The choking feeling in her throat wouldn't let words come out. She strained to hold back her screams, fearful of frightening her sister any more. She knew she had to be strong for her this one last time. Denis whispered Kaylin's name, beckoning her closer. Darken Rawl did this to me. He wasn't here, but he did this to me. I know, Kaylin said, with all the tenderness she could gather. Lie still. It will be all right. I will take you home. She knew it was a lie knew Denis would not be all right. Please, Kaylin, she whispered, kill him. Stop this madness. I wish I were strong enough. Kill him for me. Anger boiled up in her. It was the first time Kaylin had ever wanted to use her power to hurt someone, to kill someone. She had gone to the brink of feeling something she had never felt before or since. A terrible wrath, a force from deep within, a frightening birthright. With shaking fingers, she stroked Denis's bloody hair. I will, she promised. Denis relaxed back in her arms. Kaylin took off the bone necklace and placed it around her sister's neck. I want you to have this. It will help protect you. Thank you, Kaylin. She smiled, tears rolling from her wide eyes down the pale skin of her cheeks. But nothing can protect me now. Save yourself. Don't let them get you. They enjoy it. They hurt me so much, and they enjoyed it. They laughed at me. Kaylin closed her eyes against the sickening sight of her sister's pain, rocked her in her arms, and kissed her forehead. Remember me, Kaylin. Remember the fun we had. Bad memories. Kaylin's head snapped up, jolted out of her thoughts. The birdman stood beside her, having come up silently, unnoticed. She nodded, looking away from his gaze. Please forgive me for showing weakness, she said, clearing her throat as her fingers wiped the tears from her face. He regarded her with soft brown eyes and sat lightly beside her on the short bench. It is not a weakness, child, to be a victim. She wiped her nose on the back of her hand and swallowed back the wail that was trying to fight its way out of her throat. She felt so alone. She so missed Denis. The birdman put his arm tenderly around her shoulder, and gave her a short, fatherly hug. I was thinking of my sister, Denis. She was murdered by order of Dark and Rahl. I found her. She died in my arms. They hurt her so bad. Rahl is not content to kill. He must see to it that people suffer before they die. He nodded his understanding. Though we be different peoples, we hurt the same. With his thumb, he brushed a tear from her cheek, 
then reached into his pocket. Hold out your hand, she did as he asked, and he poured some small seeds in it. Surveying the sky, he blew the whistle that made no sound, the one that hung from his neck, and shortly a small bright yellow bird lit with a flutter upon his finger. He placed his hand next to hers so it could climb over and eat the seeds. Kalin could feel its tiny little feet gripping her finger while it pecked away at the seeds. The bird was so bright and pretty it made her smile. The birdman's leathery face smiled with her. When it finished eating, the bird fluffed itself up and sat contentedly without fear. I thought you might like to gaze upon a small vision of beauty among the ugliness. Thank you, she smiled. Do you wish to keep him? Kalin watched the bird a moment longer, its bright yellow feathers the way it cocked its head, and then cast it into the air. I have no right, she said, watching the bird flit away. It should be free. A small smile brightened the birdman's face as he gave a single nod. Leaning forward and resting his forearms on his knees, he looked over at the spirit house. The work was almost done, maybe one more day. Long, silver-gray hair slipped off his shoulders and down around his face, hiding his expression from her. Kalin sat a while and watched Richard working on the roof. She ached to have him hold her right now, and hurt all the more because she knew she couldn't allow it. You wish to kill him, this man Dark and Rawl? he asked, without turning to her. Very much. And is your power enough? No, she admitted. And does the Seeker's Blade have enough power to kill him? No. Why do you ask? The clouds were getting darker as the day was drawing to an end. Light rain was beginning to fall once more, and the gloom among the buildings was deepening. As you said yourself, it is dangerous to be with a confessor who is in great want of something. I think this is also true of the Seeker. Maybe even more so. She paused a moment, then spoke softly. I do not wish to put words to what Dark and Rawl did with his own hands to Richard's father. It would make you fear the Seeker all the more. But know that Richard would also have let the bird fly free. The birdman seemed to laugh without sound. You and I are too smart for these tricks with words. Let us speak without them. He sat back and folded his arms across his chest. I have tried to tell the other elders what a wonderful thing the Seeker is doing for our people. How good it is that he is teaching us these things. They are not so sure, as they are set in their ways and can be stubborn, sometimes almost beyond my tolerance. I fear what you and the Seeker will do to my people if the elders say no. Richard has given you his word that he will not harm your people. Words are not as strong as a father's blood or as strong as a sister's. Kalin leaned back against the wall, pulling her cloak around her, shutting out the wet breeze. I am a confessor because I was born so. I did not seek the power. I would have chosen otherwise, would have chosen to be like other people. But I must live with what I was given and make the best of it. Despite what you may think of the confessors, despite what most people think, we are here to serve the people, to serve the truth, I love all the people of the Midlands and would give my life to protect them, to keep them free. That is all I wish to do. And yet I am alone. Richard keeps his eyes on you. He watches over you, cares for you. She looked over out of the corner of her eye. Richard is from Westland. He does not know what I am. If he knew... The birdman lifted his eyebrow at hearing this. For one who serves the truth, please do not remind me. It is trouble of my own making with consequences I must bear and fear greatly. And that only proves my words. The mud people live in a land distant from the other peoples. That has given them the luxury of being out of the reach of trouble in the past. This trouble has long arms. It will reach you. The elders can argue against helping all they want, but they will not be able to argue against the fangs of truth. All of your people will pay the price if these few put pride before wisdom. The birdman listened carefully, respectfully. Kalin turned to him. I cannot honestly say at this moment what I will do if the elders say no. It is not my wish to harm your people, but to save them from the pain I have seen. I have seen what Dark and Rawl does to people. I know what he will do. If I knew I could somehow stop Rawl by killing Savidlin's precious little boy, I would do it without hesitation, 
with my bare hands if need be, because as much as the doing of it would wound my heart, I know I would be saving all the other precious little children. It is a terrifying burden I carry, the burden of the war here. You are one who has killed other men to save others, and I know you take no joy in it. Dark and Rawl takes joy in it, believe me. Please help me save your people without hurting any of them. Tears ran down her cheeks. I want so much not to hurt anyone. Tenderly, he drew her to him and let her sob against his shoulder. The people of the Midlands are fortunate to have you as their warrior. If we can find the thing we seek and keep it from Dark and Rawl until the first day of winter, he will die. No one else will have to be hurt. But we must have help to find it. The first day of winter. Child, that is not much time. This season withers away. The next will be here soon. I do not make the rules of life, honored elder. If you know the secret to stopping time, please tell me that I might make it so. He sat quietly without an answer. I have watched you among our people before. You have always respected our wishes, never acted to bring us harm. It is the same with the seeker. I am on your side, child. I will do my best to win over the others. I only hope my words to them will be enough. I wish my people to come to no harm. It is not the seeker or me you must fear if they say no, she said as she lay against his shoulder, staring off at nothing in particular. It is the one from Dahara. He will come like a storm and destroy you. You have no chance against him. He will butcher you. That night, in the warmth of Savadlin's home, sitting on the floor, Kalin told Sidden the story of the fisherman who turned into a fish and lived in the lake, cleverly stealing bait from hooks without ever being caught. It was an old story her mother had told her when she was as little as he. The wonder in his face made her remember her own excitement when she had first heard it. Later, while Wesselon cooked sweet roots, the pleasant aroma mingling with the smoke, Savadlin showed Richard how to carve proper arrow points for different animals, harden them in the coals of the cooking fire, and apply poison to their tips. Kalin lay on a skin on the floor with Sidden curled up in a ball, snuggled asleep against her stomach as she stroked his dark hair. She had to swallow back the lump in her throat as she thought about how she had told the bird man she would even be willing to kill this little boy. She wished she could take back those words. She hated that it was true, but wished she had not put words to it. Richard hadn't seen her talking to the bird man, and she did not tell him of their conversation. She saw no point in worrying him. What would happen would happen. She only hoped the elders would listen to reason. The next day was windy and exceptionally warm, with occasional periods of driving rain. By early afternoon, a crowd had gathered at the spirit house as the roof was completed and a fire started in the new fireplace. Cries of excitement and wonder rose from the people when the first wisps of smoke emerged from the chimney. They peeked in the doorway to see the fire burning without filling the room with smoke. The idea of living without smoke in their eyes seemed as thrilling as living without water dripping on their heads. A wind-driven rain like this was the worst. It went right through the grass roofs. Everyone watched with glee as water ran off the tiles of the roof and none went inside. Richard was in a good mood as he climbed down. The roof was finished. It didn't leak. The fireplace drew well. And everyone was joyous because of what he had done for them. The men who had helped were proud of what they had accomplished, what they had learned. They acted as guides, excitedly showing off the finer points of the construction. Ignoring the onlookers, stopping only to strap on his sword, Richard headed for the center of the village where the elders waited under one of the open pole buildings. Kalin fell into his left, Savadlin to the right, intending to stand up for him. The crowd watched him go, then swept behind, spilling around the buildings, laughing and shouting. Richard's jaw was set tight. Do you think you need to take the sword? she asked. He looked to her as he continued his long strides. He smiled crookedly. Rainwater ran from his wet, matted hair. I am the seeker. She gave him a disapproving look. Richard, don't play games with me. You know what I mean. His smile widened. I'm hoping it will serve as a reminder of why they should do the right thing. Kaylin had a bad feeling in the pit of her stomach, that things were spinning beyond her control, that Richard was going to do something terrible if the elders turned him down. He had been working hard from when he woke until he fell into bed the whole time with the single thought that he would win them over. He had won over most people, 
but they were not the people who counted. She was afraid he hadn't given rational thought to what he would do if the word was no. Toffelar stood tall and proud at the center of the leaking pole structure. The rain dripping around him splashed in little puddles on the floor. Surin, Caldus, Arbrin, Bregendaren, and Hagenlet stood to his sides. They each wore their coyote hides, something Kalin had learned they did only when official events were taking place. It seemed as if the whole village was out. They spread around the open area, sitting under roofs of the open buildings, filling windows, all watching as work stopped and they waited to hear the elders speak of their future. Kalin caught sight of the bird man standing among some armed men to the side of a pole that held up the roof over the elders' heads. When their eyes met, her heart sank. She grabbed the sleeve of Richard's shirt, leaning toward him. Don't forget, no matter what these men say, we must get out of here if we are to have a chance of stopping Rawl. We are two, they are many, sword or no sword. He ignored her. Honored elders, he started in a loud, clear voice. She translated as he spoke. It is my privilege to report to you that the spirit house has a new roof that does not leak. It has also been my privilege to teach your people how to build these roofs so they may improve the other buildings of your village. I did this out of respect for your people, and I expect nothing in return. I only hope you are pleased. The six stood grim-faced as Kalin translated. There was a long silence when she finished. At last... Toffelar spoke in a determined voice. We are not pleased. Richard's expression turned dark when she told him Toffelar's words. Why? A little rain does not melt the strength of the mud people. Your roof may not leak, but only because it is clever. Clever as the ways of outsiders. They are not our ways. It would only be the beginning of outsiders telling us what to do. We know what you want. You want to be named one of us, so we will call a gathering for you. Just another clever trick of an outsider to get from us what will serve you. You wish to draw us into your fight. We say no. He turned to Savadlin. The roof of the spirit house will be put back to the way it was. The way our honored ancestors wanted it. Savadlin was livid, but he did not move. The elder, a slight smile on his pinched lips, turned back to Richard. Now that your tricks have failed, he said with disdain, would you think to harm our people, Richard with the temper? It was a taunt aimed to discredit Richard. Richard looked as dangerous as she had ever seen him. His glare turned briefly to the bird man, then back to the six under the shelter. She held her breath. The crowd was dead quiet. He turned slowly to them. I will not harm your people, he said in an even voice. There was a collective sigh of relief when Kalin spoke his words. When it was quiet again, he went on. But I will mourn for what is going to happen to them. Without turning back to the elders, his arms slowly lifted as he pointed to them. For you six, I will not mourn. I do not mourn the death of fools. His words came out like poison. The crowd gasped. Toffelar's face twisted into bitter rage. Whispers and fear spread through the onlookers. Kalin glanced over to the birdman. He seemed to have aged years. She could see in his heavy brown eyes how sorry he was. For a moment, their eyes locked, and they shared the grief of what they both knew was going to sweep over all their lives. Then his gaze sank to the ground. In a sudden flash of movement, Richard spun toward the elders, pulling free the Sword of Truth. It was so fast, almost everyone, including the elders, flinched back a step in shock and then froze in place, the six faces reflecting the fear that kept them paralyzed. The crowd began creeping back. The birdman had not moved. Kalin feared Richard's anger and understood it, too. She decided not to interfere, but to do what was necessary to protect the seeker, whatever he did next. Not even a whisper was uttered. The only sound in the dead silence was the distinctive ringing of steel. With his teeth gritted, Richard pointed the glinting sword at the elders, its tip inches from their faces. Have the courage to do one last thing for your people. Richard's tone sent a chill through her. Kalin translated out of reflex, too transfixed to do anything else. Then, unbelievably, he turned the sword around, holding it by the point. 
holding the hilt out to the elders. Take my sword, he commanded. Use it to kill the women and children. It will be more merciful than what Dark and Rawl will do to them. Have the courage to spare them the torture they will suffer. Give them the charity of a quick death. His countenance withered their expressions. Kalin could hear women starting to cry softly as they clutched their children. The elders, in the grip of a terror they hadn't expected, did not move. At last, their eyes fled from Richard's glare. When it was clear to all they did not have the courage to take the sword, Richard painstakingly slid it back into its scabbard, as if slowly extinguishing their last chance at salvation. An unequivocal gesture that the elders had forfeited forever the aid of the seeker. The finality of it was frightening. Then at last he broke his hot glare at them and turned to her, his face changing. When she saw the look in his eyes, she swallowed hard. It was a look of heartache for a people he had come to love but could not help. All eyes stayed on him as he closed the distance between them and took her gently by the arm. Let's collect our things and get moving, he said softly. We've wasted a lot of time. I only hope it wasn't too much. His gray eyes were wet. I'm sorry, Kalen, that I chose wrong. You did not choose wrong, Richard. They did. Her anger at the elders had a finality to it, too. A door closing on any hope for these people. She cut off her concern for them. They were the walking dead. They had been offered a chance and had chosen their own fate. When they passed Savidlin, the two men locked arms for a moment without looking at each other. No one else made a move to leave. They stayed and watched the two outsiders walk quickly among them. As they passed, a few reached out and touched Richard. He returned the wordless sympathy with a squeeze of his hand on their arms, unable to bear meeting their eyes. They gathered up their things from Savidlin's house, stuffing their cloaks into the packs. Neither spoke. Kalin felt empty, drained. When their eyes met at last, they suddenly came together in a wordless embrace, a shared grief for their new friends, for what they both knew would happen to them. They had gambled with the only thing they had, time, and lost.